Jay Crawford, Adam the Bull, Garrett Bush, Tyvis Powell, Jason Lloyd. Plus, da 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 da, you're loving him, Mikey McNuggets. And so many big names, it would take me hours to say all of their names. The ultimate Cleveland sports show starts now. Booyah! If you had the Cleveland Crunch as the next team to win a championship in the city of Cleveland, mark your bingo card appropriately. Did anybody know that they won a championship I last had night? No idea what I checked their website. So there's a real coordinated effort to get the Cleveland Crunch con- uh, coverage. I got five or six random email on my WKYC uh, account from seven o'clock this morning to about, uh, they're still coming in. So it must have been a couple of big diehard fans said, let's inundate the media so we can get some coverage. I went to the Cleveland Crunch website. And they hadn't even yet updated that they won the championship yesterday. What is the Cleveland Crunch? <laughs> They're a like minor, minor league soccer team that they play indoors. They used to play at the IX. Why am I not hearing Ant? Is your IFB in? Yeah. I mean, I, I just know. put my mic on. Talk I forgot again, to put my mic on. Hello. Can yeah, you hear me? Yeah, you're really super low. Like, almost indecipherable. Uh, they are an indoor soccer team. I remember, like, they the won old a championship. Crunch. I looked this up. They won a championship in 1994. So this is actually the 30th anniversary. I vaguely remember the 94. I think I remember. And then that. they moved. Am I right, Ant? You're gonna have to help me on this, bro. Yeah. So my old go- goalkeeper coach was Otto Orff, and he was their goalkeeper yes. when they won. Yes. Yes. I remember Otto. And then Orf. they moved. I don't know what year they moved though. Yeah. Ant's just is it the same? Is it M I S L or is it? They- yeah, I think that's it. Isn't it? I'd have to look it up. I have not gone to a game since they came back. Where do and they play? And you're a huge soccer fan. I go down to the crew, though, now. Where do they play? They were playing at the IX Center. Oh, and my God. <laughs> last I heard, my cousin saw them play at, like, some sports complex in North Olmstead. Oh, boy. I know what that is. I know where that North Olmstead sports So, congratulations complex. to the Cleveland Crunch. Yeah. All right. All right. Where's the parade? <laughs> it actually already happened. <laughs> It, it was, was last the players night driving <laughs> from the Greyhound bus station back to their cars at their facility. Oh, wow. which I don't even know where that is. Wow. But uh, we shouldn't mock. They won a championship. That's yeah. better than, uh, you know. And they're getting bludgeoned this morning for winning a championship. <laughs> well, they wanted coverage. I, I, like I said, there was this coordinated effort to get some coverage for the Cleveland Crunch. Wow. I'll run it by the New York Times and see if they see want if to they're interested. <laughs> I'm sure. Come on, the Athletics are going to bite on that, won't they? <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Uh, the funny thing to me was I before I. Wanted, before I was going to say anything, I wanted to make sure they indeed won. Yeah. So I went to their website, and it said, Cleveland Crunch wins semifinals, clinches spot in finals. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I mean, that's bad. If the, if the own website run by the team doesn't have updated this morning <laughs> that they've won a championship, come on. <laughs> I mean, they probably have like four or five people working I get in the it. social media I get department, it. if that. And I always respect the grind of minor league sports teams. Oh, yeah. I always, always respect the grind. First of all, a heartfelt congratulations. Whatever league you're in, if you win it, it's, it's noteworthy. Yeah. So congratulations to the Cleveland Crunch. And we do now have another championship banner to fly over the city of Cleveland. Well, if the Lakers hung a banner for, for an in-season tournament. <laughs> this counts. Can you hang a banner in the IX Center for... I didn't even know the IX Center had sporting events. <laughs> I mean, Do they still have the Ferris wheel? <laughs> no, they pulled that out. Oh, okay. They pulled that out, I think, after COVID. Anyhow, welcome to the program. Our Cleveland Cavaliers are uh, in the playoffs. Asterisk, huge asterisk. We're going to get into that. Guardians play a day game. In fact, first pitch is 10 minutes from now. It's part of the uh, Patriots Day. Yep. The Boston Marathon is today. Yep. And every, every year when the marathon is run, the Red Sox play a morning game. Mm-hmm. And it happens to be the Guardians who are in town for that. They had a big, big win yesterday that I had, quite frankly, already put in the L column. Um, so they kind of snatched that win from the jaws of defeat. We'll talk about that and the fact that they avoided the sweep, which is always good. Also, we're going to do our mock draft. Mike, you want to explain how this is going? We went to the ESPN mock draft site, and we all did one, right? So and we we're going to compare PFF the results. mock draft as a group a couple weeks ago. ESPN actually last week created their own mock draft simulator, so you guys were each technologically advanced enough to create one for yourself, send it in, 
and we're gonna discuss and have the, the viewers vote on which mock draft easy. they like the best. Piece of cake. It's so easy a caveman can do it. My a dad could do it. I texted Jason at first to be like, hey, can you test this out? Let me know if it's as easy as I think it should be. And he didn't answer for a while, so I texted my dad and my ADD dad figured boy. it out. So. I started to do it, and then I had a lot going on. It's actually at the Guardians yesterday. Zach Miles and I were working on a story. And, like, when he sent out the rundown last night, I was like, oh, man, I yeah. never did that. Yeah. I apologize. It, it literally <clears throat> takes about two minutes. Before we start, though, Earl, I know you got something you want to mention this morning. Yeah, so. speaking of baseball, man, 77 years ago today, Jackie Robinson broke baseball's color True. barrier. And uh, I just want to pay homage to Jackie Robinson, man. Thanks for everything that you've done to, you know, kind of, like, push the movement forward. Also, shout out to Donovan Mitchell. Yesterday at the Cavaliers game, uh, they started their inaugural uh, scholarship foundation to where they give scholarships to people attending or going to HBCUs. And the Spider Care Foundation is a major contributor to that. So shout out to Jackie Robinson. Shout out to Donovan Mitchell. Well done. That's Very great. well done. Yeah, tax day. All the players in Major League Baseball will wear number 42 today, right? Yeah. In Correct. all the games. Which I think is one of the – I mean, how can you pay tribute to a, a single player? I think it's the single biggest – nod to any player that baseball has ever done and they do it every year and I Absolutely. think it's a great thing yeah. great thing uh, a lot of people in Cleveland know the trials and tribulations of Larry Doby yep. who a very short time later became the first black player in the American, American League. League he always and gets, he overlooked. gets overshadowed yeah he does it's a, I, shame it's a shame that he does because of Jackie yeah I remember um I think it was his son wrote a book there was some somebody we had a guest on cold pizza and Larry Doby's relative and one I think maybe the author of the book came in and I remember that story always sticks with me about a story that they chronicle in the book where they were playing the Washington Senators and Larry had to stay in another hotel Jeez. so he couldn't even stay with his teammates and this is the part this is the most I get a mental image of this and it is absolutely heartbreaking gut-wrenching that this happened in some people that we know is lifetime, lifetime yeah. this man would have to put his full uniform, including his spikes on, at the hotel and went to try to hail a cab, but no one would pick him up. Jeez. So he walked in full uniform, spikes, glove in hand, to a baseball game that he was going to play to entertain th- tens of thousands of fans. It's, it's unbelievable, unbelievable that that happened. Yeah. It really yeah. is truly unbelievable. So to, to Jackie, major shout out. And on this day, I always like to mention Larry too. Yeah. I, I, near and dear to me, he was my dad's first favorite player. Mm-hmm. I remember uh, you told that story. My dad was nine years old when he broke into the league. And he wanted me, my dad played center field. He wanted me to play center field. And I always asked why. And he goes, because Larry Doby played center field. Wow. And no one played it better. Yeah. So there's that. Okay, Mike. Awesome. We're going to talk some Cavs and their decision to set up a first round matchup with any team not named Philadelphia or Miami in one sec. But first, a quick word from eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. That's the formula for winning championships. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into power, speed, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With more than 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home some big-time wins. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit is only available for U.S. customers. So I'll ask you guys this very simply, very plainly, point blank. J.B. Bickerstaff said before the game yesterday, the Cavs had a plan. They'd play their starters three quarters. They let the other guys play the fourth. He admitted to scoreboard watching before the game, and in his post-game comments, admitted they were keeping an eye on the other scores around the league. It seems like they made a conscious organizational decision when they saw how the scores were falling to see whatever happens in the first Wait, are quarter. you being nice? Seems like. I mean, they said it was the plan beforehand. They followed their yeah, plan. Yeah, no, they had a plan and they stuck to it. They stuck to it. And the New York game ended way after their game ended. So there was no guarantee that win or lose, they would have locked up a different seed. So that's why I say it seems. But it could also be interpreted as a scaredy cat move. So do you think it was the smart move to... 
lose in the fourth quarter, put Isaiah Mobley at the two guard with Imani Bates at the one for the entire quarter, and set up a first round matchup with Orlando and or Indiana. It ended up being Orlando. Or is it a uh, chicken shit move to avoid <laughs> the potential matchup of Miami or Philadelphia? So wait, the, the choices round. were scaredy cat or a chicken smart, shit? Smart or chicken oh, shit? Okay. Those are two choices. Because <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but I want you to start, Jace, because you know way more about the inner workings of this team and how this is, this is a global decision. Yeah. And this did not happen in JB's office alone. JB did not make this decision. Yeah. Like, this is not a coach's decision. Yep. This came from well above JB. However they were going to approach it, whatever, whatever plan they had in place, the, the coach is the one that has to walk in the locker room and look these guys in the eyes. Yep. So he's not the one, and he's the one that has to go out and answer all the questions in front of the media about it. So this is coming from above him. And if they, like, there's, there's so many layers to this. There's so much to this. They have been, they've had their eye on, they can say whatever they want. They've had their eye on Philadelphia since Embiid got hurt. Yep. We've talked about it on this show that I had conversations with people over there like it'd be just our luck that Philly would fall and we'd catch them in the first round and then jo- Joel would be back. So, like, you can't ignore that. Like, that, that's f- absolutely part of this. And another part of this is if they lose in the first round, regardless of the opponent, if they lose in the first round, there's a lot of people out of jobs. There's a lot of people getting cleaned out of there. You don't trade for Donovan Mitchell. Rightfully so. Yeah, you don't trade for Donovan Mitchell to lose in the first round two years in a row. Nope. So there's jobs at stake here. Like, that's the, the bigger picture in all of this. And, yeah, I don't think they want anything to do with Philly or Miami. I think they wanted Orlando. And, you know, of, of all their options, Orlando and Indiana probably were the, the best ones out there, the most enticing ones out there. And, and now we'll see. Like, you got what you want, and now we'll see. But the, the bigger picture of this is – They've never won a playoff series under Dan's ownership without LeBron. That's a fact. They've won one playoff game. I can tell you that matters to Dan Gilbert. They want to win a playoff series without LeBron. And they can say, if they, win, if they beat Orlando, they can say, look it, we have made incremental progress every year. We were a play-in team, lost in the play-in round. Then we made the playoffs last year, lost to the Knicks. As a, as a home as advantage. As a home advantage, lost the Knicks in a terrible series. But <clears throat> now you come back this year, hey, look, we won a playoff series. Yeah, they can point and, and they can say we've made progress every single year. Now, the way that they got here feels a little dirty. Yeah, it does. It feels a little messy and dirty. But by the time we get to Saturday, no one's going to be talking about this. Like, we're going to talk about this today. We'll talk about it tomorrow. I'm sure Bull's going to want to get it off. Garrett's going to want to get it off. And then once we do that, it's going to move on to the series, and no one's going to talk about this anymore. But absolutely, I think this is a manipulation because well, they need to win a playoff series. You don't think they'll talk about this when they get ready to start their second round series against Boston? Well, you're going to. So that's the other part of this. You're going to play Boston one way or the other. Like you, you're, you're going to have to get. You through are, Boston. but Jace, I think it's obvious. The longer each team plays, the more likelihood that one of their stars gets, gets hurt. hurt. Sure. Yeah. So if they play four games in their first series and win in a sweep, yeah. there's four chances for them to lose a key piece. Right. Then they see the Cavs. Right. If they see the Cavs in the finals and not the Eastern Conference Finals, or, or semi Eastern Conference Semifinals or Eastern Conference Finals, right. there's five, six, maybe seven more opportunities for yes. them to lose a key wheel. Yeah. I mean, anyone will tell you winning a championship is a war of attrition because yes. guys just get beat up, banged up, you lose guys. Uh, the year the Cavs won the championship, the Warriors lost Bogut. You know, like right. that was a big loss for them at the, at when they lost them. So there's always so do you that like factor. it or do, no? I see both sides of it. I see, I, I know how important it is to this organization to win a playoff series, and I know what that you're trying to sell Donovan Mitchell on a future, and losing in the first round is not selling him on a future. I'm not sure winning a first round series yeah. and getting boat race in the second round, if that's how it goes. Right. I'm not sure that sells him either. But I understand why they're doing this. But ultimately, it feels gross. <laughs> like it's it's like I don't I've never understood. I actually called someone yesterday. It was like, what what is with this three quarters? Oh, with another team. Like, what is the three quarters? And then sit for the fourth. Either play guys or sit. Yeah, guys. I, that's what I thought. Either play him or sit. Because guess what? What if what if one of the starters turns an ankle and he's out for two weeks and in, in the second and third yeah, quarter yeah. of a game you're not trying to win? Right. So either either you sit the guys or you play the That's guys. That's what I thought. This half in, half out, I've never understood that. Because, I mean, Mike can tell you, 
guys, they have to go through so much to like activate their bodies to get sure. ready to play a game that either make them do it or don't. And like, they've got so much rest. It's not they like they're going to rest the guys. you got a week. Donovan should have sat. Donovan had no business playing I that couldn't game. believe that he played. With that, Especially when it came to the point where they're white flagging it in the end. Well, with the knee situation, he, situ- didn't, play yeah, he didn't play yesterday. He, he played, played two games ago. He played Indiana. Well, he played against Indiana. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but they needed to win that game. They needed to win one of the last two. They right? got Yeah, they got and, Indiana. And which of the two were easier to win? No, you needed to beat Indiana. You needed I, to beat Indiana. Yeah. Why? I, what if, if they'd have lost to Indiana and won yesterday, it would have been the same, same result. They'd still be exactly where they are now. But you, I mean, in the, in the moment, Indiana's in town. Like, you need, to, you need to play that game. You need to win that game. Thank you. you yeah, but win I, that game. I, I get that. But you're and also plus, looking ahead to the last game. Plus, you can't beat them with a full effort well, minus also, Donovan Mitchell. But, no, you, the, you play Donovan against Indiana, win that game, and then you can sit him for the final game, and now you give him those extra – like, he should have sat. Like, that, that was the right call for him to sit yesterday. Get him off his knee. I talked to him. Mike, I assume we're going to talk about this on the podcast tomorrow a little bit. Yeah, great article if you didn't read it, by the way. Phenomenal article. So, I talked to – uh, Donovan after the Indiana game and we went in depth a little bit more on his knee because I've just been confused by the whole injury. Right. And he went through about when he heard it, how he heard it, and he said it's just tendonitis. Um, so that needs rest. That, that, it needs rest. That, that's rest. Yes. So win the Indiana game, get him off his feet, sit the finale, give him this full week off, and hopefully you'll see the best version of Donovan uh, on Saturday. Did the contract afternoon. come up? No, because I knew he was going to answer it anyway. Sure. So... Uh, we talked about we talked about the knee. We talked about uh, we talked about a lot. We talked about a lot. I, I am definitively in the I don't like it camp. Yeah. I, I just think it's a loser's mentality. It is. It's, it's, for, it, like look at the Knicks. Like the Knicks the are Knicks like, went out, balled out. Now yeah. okay, they're in the two. Yeah. And they've got a tough first round matchup. Yep. There's no other way around it. But you know what? The Knicks aren't in this to win a series. No. Now they did that last year, but they're in it to win it. Yeah. And, and it, it, I just think it sends a bad message to your players. And fans, I think. Yeah. and, and you, But your play, course, I, I get the player yeah, part of it. Of course you worry about your fans, yes. Of, but you really have to worry about the 15 guys in that locker room. And it, I just feel like, like it, Max Drews, to me, looked pretty pissed off yesterday. He no, was he, adamantly, and Earl was in the locker room with me yesterday. First time Earl got a chance to get the media side of it. Earl, how upset compared to how George sounded, how the Mobley sounded, how much different was the tone of Max Drews in the locker room? Man, y'all hear me talk all the time. When you come to communication, body language is the most important part to communication. He was visibly upset and pissed off. This is a dude who went out there. Shout out to Max Drews, first career triple-double, but he wanted to go out there and win this game. I hear your argument. I hear your argument. I'm going to go ahead and say I thought it was a smart move, and mm-hmm. this is why. The Cavaliers are dealing with injuries to pretty important players. Sure. Donovan Mitchell being at the very top of that list. The Cavaliers have struggled over the last two months of the season to close the season out. They last 10 games of the year, they went four and six. This is a team that hasn't played their best basketball, are dealing with injuries. And of course, if you're in that situation, you want to put yourself in a position to have the most favorable first round matchup possible for all the reasons that Jason just mentioned, right? Because you want to be able to try to sell progress to Dan Gilbert, to the fan base, is it progress to you, to everybody else, to me, no, it's not. If they beat Orlando, no, it's not. In a sweep, so, but I'm just saying, this is why. No, to answer you, no, it's not progress okay. to me. But this is what they're trying to sell: that if you can go out here and you beat Orlando in the first round, and you just so happen to lose to Boston, that hey, you know what? We gradually have gotten better over the last three years. I call BS on that, yes. but this is how I see it. And so, if you play Orlando in the first round, I think it's, it does something for the psyche. I think it does something for the confidence of this basketball team if you can get out of the first round of the series. So I thought the Cavs played it smart. They're trying to get healthy. They want the best possible matchup that gives them the best chance to advance in the playoffs and then see what happens in the second round. At the end of it all, Jason, to me personally, I don't care if they get out of the first round or not, unless this team make the Eastern Conference Finals, I think everybody's getting fired anyway. You know, on the, the progress end of it, if they beat Orlando and lose to the Celtics and then have a, their, their post-mortem news conference and anybody tries to stand up there and say, look, we made progress, you know, we went another round, you can tell me you're a cat, but if you walk on two feet and you don't have a tail, you're not a cat. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I, I can tell with my own two eyes what you are. But they did it last year. They lost the first round and said, but hey, we won 51 games. Sure they did. And guess what? I didn't buy that uh, either. Nobody did. And the fans, I don't think, buy it particularly when they made off-season moves yes. that we all sat here and said, these are good moves. That's it. These are nice moves. This is a better 
basketball team. And they never found the gel, with the exception of that 18-2, and two, which they kind of stepped in by accident. Mm-hmm. And as soon as they got, were full strength again, the team, the season was over. The team was not as good. Now, I know Donovan Mitchell's injury after the All-Star break had a lot to do with that. But to me, I, and, and I'll, I'll juxtapose this, but I know we're not huge golf fans here, but I, I, I watched the final round of the Masters yesterday, and I, I love to watch sports and winners and how they operate. I just love it. I, I'm fascinated by winner's mentality and loser's mentality. This is the same team that blew a 26-point lead a week and change ago. Mm-hmm. This is the same club, okay? And th- th- they lost that because they had a loser's mentality. They took their foot off the ga- gas. They, they stopped pressing the action. And they were hoping that they could hold on till the very end. Well, that's the recipe to lose. We all know that. That same mentality is what we saw on display yesterday. I would, if the Knicks flame out in the second round, I feel better being a fan of the Knicks because here's why. There's, and this is, I don't know if this has ever happened. I don't know how we look this up. The difference between the two seed and the eight seed, four games. I, I've never seen, I can't remember a time that's ever happened. Yeah. Any division. Yeah. Jay, let me ask you this. What if New York loses in the first round? I was that's, what ask I, that. That, that's my point. It, I would be able to swallow losing in the first round to, by the way, a team that I think is better than them. I, I do. I do. You think Philly's better than New York? I do. Yeah. I just think they are. I, I don't think they're better by much. Philly at full strength. But I think Philly at full strength is a better team. There is honor in taking on the champion, and you gave it your best effort. I just, I just don't. So back to the the, the Masters. Oh, but, I, I oh, watch, I ahead. watch sporting events. I watch how Golden State conducted themselves. What's their mindset? What what is their body language saying? How teams that have built dynasties. I loved watching the Bulls during their dynasty, and it doesn't just mean basketball. It could be any sport. I loved watching Tiger when he was the front running throat slashing king. He didn't. He man, you talk about no prisoners. That he wrote the book. Yesterday, Scotty Scheffler in a three-hole span, went birdie, birdie, birdie. He was down the leaderboard. Birdie, birdie, birdie. He never looked at the leaderboard once from the fifth, sixth hole. Didn't look at it. He was in the lead. In fact, at one point, he had a three-, four-stroke lead. Didn't look. Didn't care to him. You know what he can control? What he does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what anybody else behind him. What's Max Homa doing? Oh, he just put one out of bounds. Does I don't care. That doesn't affect me. I am going to play, and that's what champions do. In my, in my estimation, champions don't give a rat's ass about who the competition is and what they're doing. We're going to do our game. We're going to inflict our game, our style on you, and you see if you can keep up. That's what winners do. LeBron, you say it all the time. Just get me in. I don't care. Yes, I don't care where, I don't we, care where we are. Just He's doing it now. Yeah. Look at him now. Just I, I don't in. disagree with y'all, but I, I use another sport for an analogy, right? Look at Floyd Mayweather. Floyd Mayweather was always strategic. He was a defensive and fighter. Though. He was always strategic on the opponents that he fought. Right. Just because he could fight didn't mean he was going to go fight somebody that might be able to knock his ass out. I never strate- liked that about Floyd. He was strategic in picking his opponents to, gave, to give him the advantage. And I never liked that. And about I think Floyd. that's what the Cavaliers now, are doing in this situation. If you, it, what's Floyd Mayweather known for? Defense. Yeah, but I'm just so saying. In, in I'm a, giving a, you the comparison. In a one-on-one this is- one sport, which is a gladiator sport, like he knew how to survive. No, I'm, I, I get and, that. And he did it. I'm just playing a devil got advocate. I understand that. And, and that's a great, the, by the way, that's a great of example yeah. of someone who didn't have so sometimes that winner's like, mentality, sometimes but always won. It's just like growing up. Just like just just because you know you can fight, don't mean you go picking fights with everybody. Right. Right. You got to be smart about how you move. Sure. And I think the Cavaliers are just being smart with how they move. This is a team that hasn't played their best basketball and are dealing with injuries and maybe playing the Orlando Magic, who they might view as a weaker opponent, might do something for their psyche if they can go out there play their hand well and play well. Maybe. That can build confidence I mean, going maybe. into the second round. One we'll thing see. I'll push back on if they if the Cavs because you. At the time, you had no way of knowing if you were going to be two or three. I know. So if they... So Knicks, you play it like the Knicks. You so just, if, let's say, Cavs win, Knicks lose. Yeah. And now you're the two. Yep. Had the Cavs lost in the first round to, it doesn't matter, Philly, Miami, whatever, yeah. the vast majority, maybe not everybody, the vast majority of fans would be irate. See, That I, they'll take a series win over Orlando. I get it. You take a series you? win. Like, like it, at the, in the grand scheme of things... 
No one here started the year by saying, God, if we could just make the second round. Right. If we can make the second round, we're going to have a parade. Nobody thinks that way. Correct. And, and here's the thing. I would say this to you. Had the Cavs nailed the two and lost to Philly in the first round, you know what I would say? What an awful break. They got Philly at full strength. And in truth, they're not a better team than Philly. They're just not. Mm-hmm. They're not. Yeah. So they lost to a team that was better than them. It's how you play it. Are you going to – is the first round uh, series seven games this year? Yeah. yeah it's, it's been, been seven games, games for, for a while now. Okay. I thought – what was – I thought last year – It used year to be five, five but that was like ago. years okay. ago. Yeah. Okay. But, Jason, help yeah, me out. Yeah, 4-1 last year with, but, the, with the Knicks. But help me out because you, you, you cover this more than all of us, right? I can think back to the years that Golden State was winning championships or when Houston was trying to compete to, to win that championship. It was like other teams was doing that then. That was, that was in good spaces. This is not the first time that we've seen a no. team purposely win or lose itself. to try to position Correct. itself in the playoffs. It every year. This happens every year. I get your point. The, re- like the, re- the way that the Cavs have played over the last couple months is frustrating you. It's pissing you off because this is a team that's been hot and cold. They've been teetering in the wrong direction. And you go out there and you see them lay an egg against a team that they damn well should have beat. I get that. But on the other side of it, man, you got to play your hands smart, Jay. Like, we're getting into the playoffs, and you want to show some type of success. Do we want to see a second-round exit? No. But it's not like this team was going to go win an NBA championship. And as far as I'm concerned, when this is all said and done, it's only going to be one team that was satisfied with the outcome of the season. And that's what it should be, by the way. Yeah, for sure. Like, I, I, if you're the Cavs and you make it to the finals, there is solace in that. There's, that's a consolation win. Because you're, you, now you know, coming into next year, if you can maybe add a piece... Now you're looking at things saying, we're in the upper echelon. We're in the top four. So we're in a pretty good spot. Top two. But the way the East is configured, Mm -hmm. like I said, I I can't remember a year where there was four games that separated all these teams. There's Boston, and then there's everybody else. Mm -hmm. I looked at the West yesterday. I don't know how it finished out. I believe the difference between two and eight in the West is ten games. Where in the East... Technically, yeah. Nine, nine games, really, because Denver okay. and Oklahoma City finished tied. So, Okay, but I, well, well, yesterday when I looked, I thought there was 10 games difference. It, 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 I, didn't, I don't know how everything shook, shook out yesterday. But my point here is, if, if you've got four, eight, six, seven teams within four games of one another, that's a blender. That's a crapshoot. Philly is the wild card. Miami also, I, I love the way Miami plays it. Miami's like, we're good. They do this every year. They, they've, you know why? Because Pat Riley and now Spo are smart enough. They've been through the battles. They, they get this. You're going to win an extra 20 games to get one more game at home? Yeah. Like, that's, that's, told, that's nonsense. I told Mike earlier, we all know Boston is the clear-cut favorite to come out the East. But, man, oh, man, to draw, like, an Eric Spoelstra coach team in the first I round. I wouldn't want it. <laughs> like, I've heard experts say you could speak to this, that – Boston is great, but if they're not hitting threes and they're not rebounding, they can get got just like any I other team in the NBA. I have zero faith in their coach. Zero. And, zero. And, by the way, it is serious. this is Against. the time of year where the coaching now matters. Yeah. For sure. Like, honestly, I don't think there's anything the Cavs can do short of beating Boston in the second round that saves anyone's job. To me, when they blew the 26-point lead to the Clippers, I, had, I'm, I if I own the team... I am done. I'm not going to fire them right then. You don't want a new coach going into the playoffs. But I've made up my mind. You want to keep your job? Make it to the finals. Make it to the East finals. Well, I don't think it will happen in the regular season. No, but Jay, that was a dumpster fire. Oh, it was terrible. But it was the regular season and this is the playoffs. And the playoffs is the only thing that matters. So I don't know necessarily whatever happened in the regular season will have an impact on that. But I I mean, jobs are absolutely at stake in this, which goes back to Does Kobe go too? He might. Depending on how this goes, yeah, there's a chance that that happens for sure. Because, again, if, if Donovan forces his way out, anything is possible this summer. Because that was, a, that was an all the chips in the center of the table trade. And if you make that trade and you have nothing to show for it. Like, again, the Donovan thing changes how we have this entire conversation. Mm-hmm. If Donovan's not here and this team is progressing this way, nobody's upset. No. Nobody's mad. No. But it's the Donovan piece. It's that you went out and you, you made this big move. You have a top to bring 15 this, player now. To top bring this guy player. in. And by the way, I'm, I'm kind of going on two tangents here. So the, the Donovan piece is, is really what has really amped all of this up. 
But this is still like Bull asked a question. He he gave us a Mikey special last week and said, "What's more likely, the Cavs lose four games to the Celtics by twenty five or more points, or the Cavs beat the Celtics?" I took the Cavs to beat the Celtics. Well, I would too. I don't think they're going to lose four games by twenty five. This points. is a really talented roster. It is, and if you, and they've done well against Boston. And if you give Donovan a week off to rest his knee, if he's back the way, do you think playing, that'll be enough? Yeah, I I don't know if he's going to be one hundred percent. But I think he was starting to turn the corner the other night, and you give him a week off, I think he's going to feel pretty good by Saturday. And this is a really talented team, and there's no reason that they can't get hot again. There's no reason. What, could he get to like 90%, 95% I don't in your know. mind? I don't know. Because I to he me, looked as good as he looked since the injury against Indiana yes. on Wednesday night. Jason, you and I were there. Mm-hmm. He moved. The explosiveness vertically still isn't back. The lateral quickness was back. He had good elevation on his jump shot. I thought it was... 75-ish percent, and now he gets 10 days, essentially, from that game to that game should be one of the... That huge, yeah. That should be... Now, he should look great in game one. My concern is game two. Jason, I got a question for you. And uh, the full... Sc- not to cut you off. The full schedule has been released yet, but mul- in the first round, you get multiple days off between games. So, great points on, on Kobe Altman. Remember when we had the conversation about Andrew Berry and Kevin Stefanski? Yeah. And there was the talk, Will, if Kevin Stefanski is going to go, if Andrew Berry would too. Yeah. And we had the conversation. We compared it to grocery shopping. Okay, here's the grocery list of things that Kevin Stefanski needs to have this team better or in a better position next year. We said, okay, Andrew Berry went out here. He went grocery shopping. Now it's up to Kevin Stefanski to go in the kitchen and make a quality meal with what he's gotten. I think Kobe Altman did the same thing this offseason. He looked at what we had. He said, okay, I'm going to go get some shooting. I like the I'm going to go shop with, for some shooting. JB, this is on you. I don't so think if he this falls it apart, is it like, do you still see both of them going? Or the reason Kobe? Kobe goes is the Donovan piece. It's the Donovan piece? If Donovan, if Donovan forces his way out, and I don't know if he will or not. I, mm-hmm. I don't do you have know. a gut? If you, right now, if you had to put chips in the table. He's out. He's gone. Yeah. Yeah, if if you're if you're like gun to my head, you got I got to make a choice. He's gone. Wow. But but there is still time. I like again. I've said this before. I've been trying to write for a month. I'm just going to write it. I've been trying to write. His best path forward is to sign the extension because it truly is his best path yeah, forward. Yeah, well, it, it shows him more the, money. You get I the agree. money. You get the money. I don't know why he wouldn't. You kick the if, if he's just done because he'll get the money anyway because they're going to trade him. And when you trade him, your bird rights go with you, so he could sign the same deal elsewhere. Well, they don't have to trade him. They don't have to, but you, 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 they don't have to, but they have to. Because well, you can't it's interesting let, because the, the Guardians were in that situation with Shane Bieber. Yeah. And now they can't. Well, yeah, but this is a little bit different because farm systems being what they are in baseball, basketball, all you have is the draft. And they've traded five years of control of their draft right. yeah. in exchange for this guy. And they're gonna, you don't have to trade him, but you have to trade him if he's not going to sign the extension. And, but his best path forward, I believe, is to sign the extension, kick the can down the road, give this one more year. If you sign an extension, you're not necessarily committing yourself to all those years in Cleveland. You're committing yourself to one and more year. And the longer the extension, the more the Cavs would reap in, in a trade. Because then the, 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 the trading team would have right. longer control. This is what he did when he was in Utah. It's exactly what he this did. This is what Kevin Durant did when he was in Brooklyn. And you mm-hmm. sign the contract knowing you're probably not going to play, play out that contract in that city, but you get your money, the team gets another year with you, and then they recoup assets when they move, when they, when they move you on. What risk does he run if the Cavs just say, we're not trading you? Well, then, I mean, he'll say, okay, and he'll play out his last season, and he'll walk. No, no, I'm saying if they sign to him, he does an extension. Oh, to, to lock in yeah. the max. Yeah, okay. And he then after the one year, he says, okay, I want out. And they're like, no. Well, he, they could try that, but it will not end well for the Cavs. It never has. It hasn't. Historically, the team. It will not end well. Yeah. You know, because to, it's a player-driven league. Yes. To, to me, when I hear you all talk about this situation, clearly the Cavs went all in when they made the trade for Donovan Mitchell, and that sped up the, pro, the prior process with everything. Evan Mobley's development, Darius Garland's development, et cetera. At this point, this is how I feel about it because I hear you talk about this a lot, and you're more in tune than I am. If you really feel like in your in your gut that Donovan Mitchell is out of here, I have to roll with that. But at the same time, if I'm Dan Gilbert, I gave you all the firepower in the world to go make this trade. Kobe, you do whatever you have to do to see this through. Sure. Don't handicap yourself with these three other core players because the the main priority, the main objective is Donovan Mitchell. You know he's your alpha dog. 
You know he's your team leader on and off the court. You do everything in your power to make sure he don't leave Cleveland. And that means whatever it is you got to do. Because if but you if let he him wants walk, to leave, like Jason just said, if he wants to leave, it's a fait accompli. You just Kawhi. better hope that you get to that situation to where he don't. Kawhi Leonard won a championship in Toronto and, and said, left. And see, he's out of here. Hey, uh, way off topic, and I know we got we're going to switch after the break to talk about their chances against Orlando and how this series plays out. And way off topic, where does LeBron play next year? <laughs> LA. <laughs> Uh, in, my, in the words of a of a mod crunk, Cleveland. <laughs> Can I, man? Why are you doing this to me at eleven thirty five? Here's on why. April I, 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 I know. You, I know you have an educated guess, <laughs> which is more than most. Go most have a hope. It. I know. I'm going to no. Say it. I'm going to say I'm not making. I'm not making. <laughs> no, I'm you're not going there. I'm not making a headline. Okay. Again, you got a hundred poker call. chips on the table. How many of them you are putting in the middle that he's going to? No, LA? let's do this the other way. We're going to do it the same way that he did it with Donovan. Gun to your head. Yeah, that's <laughs> a little harsh. <laughs> Gun to your head. Because that's all or nothing. <laughs> what I'm asking is, you've got a hundred poker chips. Yeah. How are you splitting them up as to where he plays? I'm going to go pee and sit this hand out. No, you're not. What do you got? Eighty for the Lakers. Uh, yeah. Ten let's for go, Cleveland. Ten go. for everywhere else. Let's go seventy, eighty for the Lakers. Okay, that's what I feel too. Yeah. And then what if the remaining twenty, thirty go to Cleveland? And... <laughs> <laughs> He's not going there. Come on, let's it's go. Monday in April. <laughs> let's, right. Let's all, go. All, this is what I'm looking for. Wherever Bryce decides that he's going to go Bryce. play his. No, not Bronny, Bryce. Oh, Bryce. Wherever Bryce say he's going to play his college basketball at, that'll tell me everything I need to know. Well, Bronny, Bronny is considering Ohio State. Correct? Yeah, but see, Bryce is the better player between the two. No, I know he is. Bryce is the younger. Like, I'm just if, paying if, attention if to Bryce. If says, I'm going to go to Ohio State, doesn't it kind of give credence to the idea that LeBron would want to be back in Cleveland? I, hey. Bri- I, I believe Bronny's going to be in the NBA next year. Oh, you do? Yes. Brian's going to be the NBA. You got Michi Johnson Jr. coming back to Ohio State. You know, the Johnsons and, and the Jameses, they, they linked up. Who knows? You, <laughs> might, you, might, get, you might get Bryce that, that commit next. Hell, hey, DeJuan, DeJuan package Wagner. Package deal. Package deal. DeJuan Wagner, son, just said he was entering the transfer portal, too. So you get these kids at Ohio State, let's go. Let's do this. All right, Mike. So, Jay, real quick, I looked up the last 20 years of NBA standings to try and see if two through eight was as clustered as the Eastern Conference is this year. Couldn't find another example. No, this I can't ever clustered. remember it. Two through eight, I think, and I don't want to say NBA history, but at least what I can search on ESPN in yeah. a quick database, the most clustered we've ever seen in Eastern or Western Conference. Yeah. Two through eight, also in terms of teams intentionally setting up matchups in the playoffs. I was talking to somebody who is very well connected in the NBA <laughs> yesterday about the Cavs situation, and I'll tell you guys what he said on tomorrow's Ultimate Cavs show, but he also said oh, he was not a fan, but then he followed up with, with that being said, if I was the Lakers, I'm throwing the 7-8 game and trying to win the 8 so I don't have to see Denver in the first round. So he doesn't like that, but he also knows teams. It, it see, that situation so different, though. All the time. I mean, that's, I, I do think that, like LeBron always used to say and still believes, just get me in. Just get me in. Yeah, like, LeBron's not in this to make it to the West Finals. <laughs> and you know what? He's better off seeing the one in the first round, and here's why. 100%. You're, you're either right. done or you're the favorite. Well, and you avoid Denver to the Western Conference Finals. Exactly. So that is uh, Yo, but I, different. Not necessarily I just think with LeBron, exactly, he, he knows where the switch is. Yeah. It is crazy to see how good he really still, still is. is. Like, Incredible. This dude is. I love that guys try to throw dirt on him. Yeah. Like LeBron is just smart. He's old and he's smart now. And he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll cruise control at 60% of my accelerator. And I know when it's go time. Yeah. And I'll have plenty in the reserve when I need it. He can't do it every night anymore. And he no. can't do it. And that's he, okay. He can't even do it for an entire postseason anymore, really. But he can pick his spots. Yeah. He, can't, he can't do it for a seven-game series and then do it again in a seven-game series and then do it again or even a, a whatever number. No, I five, know what you mean. Four, what, what's six. fascinating to me is as unknown as the East playoffs are, like we could have two or three first-round upsets. Yeah. As, as fascinating as these matchups are, because everyone finished so close, I can't take my eyes off the West. And LeBron. Yeah, I think both conferences is uh, it's, it's going to be really, really fun. When you look at the East, if you look at the top three seeds, realistically, all three of those dudes, uh, teams can go home in the first round. And so for, like, for, as, for as good as – it's just been a fun competitive season. 
and, and both conferences all season yeah, long. And I'm really, really looking forward to the playoffs. Did you year. say the first, the top three seeds of the East? Yeah. Like, top, I, top, top four. four I, top four. <laughs> top four. <laughs> top, I four. top four. I mean, yeah. I don't believe, I still think they're all fool's gold. I think they're regular season products of the regular season. Boston, and they're, Boston, and they're Bo- its own Boston, Boston in its own yes, class. Boston. You know, Boston I, I'm should. talking about the West now. I mean, outside of Denver, yeah. like, I don't know. Minnesota, OK, OKC. I just, I'm not buying them. OKC is going to be around for a real, I'm not sure this year is no, their year. I agree with but that. But they are going to be That's unbelievable. They're well coached. For a long they're time. young and they're They poor. are a is machine. There? They are long and athletic. Yes, and they are. That's exactly how you want to build a team into this yes, game. That's exactly right. how you do it. Okay. Sorry, Mike. But one no more point worries, on that. Guys. Boston should roll. Boston should just I think roll it, to the finals. I think they'll roll through the finals, too. I, not, I don't want to make it sound like they'll win easily, but they're go, I think they're going to be the NBA champs. See, I, I just think Eric Spolster. I think Boston is going to win this series, but Eric Spolster is somewhere like, you got me effed up. No, I wouldn't <laughs> want Miami. Well, they want revenge from last year because – Miami knocked them out of the playoffs when they thought they had all the cards rolling their way, just like they did to Milwaukee. But we'll make our playoff predictions later in the week when we know the official matches. But, hey, guys, we got a new sponsor alert. How about Monopoly Go? I've been told that I'm a competitive person. Ant, would you agree with that? Absolutely. He's seen me play pickup. I think he understands. Well, I definitely have a competitive side. We all do, and my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you guys have heard of it by now. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one but hundreds of different Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big-time money. And the best part is messing with my friends. I can charge them rent on my iconic properties, just like <laughs> classic Monopoly. I can also rob their vaults of riches for myself, and the leaderboards show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to win huge rewards. So set up the game, get in and join the action. Just download the Monopoly Go app for free at the Apple Store or on Google Play. Got to get that boardwalk and park place no matter what. Man, listen, you, like, no I play Monopoly what. Go. Uh, I had to take it off my phone. I was playing it for a while. It's really fun. It's really mm-hmm. addictive. It's nothing like, you know, running your bank up and to wake up at 4 in the morning to realize your homeboy just, just robbed you. It is, <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is crazy. It is insane. Better but it's than, fun. Better than boardwalk and park place is all four railroads. Yo, that's you true. You can win the game. You double, your, ch- you oh. double your chances and it's so punitive. I never get it and I hit the railroad because there's one on every side of the board. Yes. And I hit it every friggin' time around the yeah. board. Man, we need to play the Cleveland version of Monopoly. Well, I've got one upstairs at my desk. We got Channel like, 3 version. Channel, Channel 3, 3 is on it. Yeah, we need yeah. to play. We need to game. WKYC is on it. Yeah, we, hey, that's uh, a real hustler, though. He, he control all the railroads. Yeah, yeah, no, that's I never, smart. I never get them. I always land on them. If you think of, like, in American history, the first real magnets in this country were the Vanderbilts, were the folks mm-hmm. that said, control transportation and you control everything. That's exactly and right. And they built the railroads. And those folks, I mean, you talk about wealth beyond, it's like Jeff Bezos' wealth yeah. back yeah. in the day. Yeah. They had it. Okay. So we talked about the Cavs playoff seeding. Let's talk about the playoff matchup now in specific. We'll talk about the Magic-Cavs matchup all week. We'll get more in depth. But initial thoughts on the actual on-court situation, Cavs versus Magic. Jay? Um, I got tell you I think it's going to be a close series um I think they split the regular season two and two right yes um I'm gonna say Cavs in six or seven I I think I think that's where I'm going here and Orlando's a tough team though like I just I just feel like we're our our calling card is not physicality no and, and and you know we're going to make it difficult on you. Yo, it's so funny. Me and Jay both so Cleveland. We get so pissed off just to come back around and be like, yeah, they're going to win. <laughs> <laughs> we we, we hey, go through all hey, of that. <laughs> I'm, I'm so Cleveland to a point. Don't ask me what I think is going to happen in round two. Because yeah. I'll yeah. be very – Look, we'll be going off of Jay. 259, who's going to win? <laughs> of course the Cavs going to win. But I, I'm with you. So I've been looking at this series, right? And Orlando, to me, they remind me so much of the Cleveland Cavaliers – last season this is a very young athletic long physical team but they lack playoff experience right um a team that kind of exceeded expectations for this year as you like to say jason they are a year ahead of whatever their plan is and i think that you know the physicality is something that worries me the size is something that worries me mike if you got that tweet that i sent to tag board 
But there's a tweet I seen right before the show that shows the size discrepancy and the starting lineups between the Cavs and the Magic. That's something that worries me. But the fact that the Cavs have took that nasty L the way that they did last year, got that sour taste in their mouth, I believe in humility before honor. And I think the Cavs having that experience, despite what it went on in this regular season, I think that gives them an advantage over a very young, athletic, physical team. Um, got a pretty good head coach who already signed an extension. I just think this is one of those situations to where, you know, the Cavs got the best player overall. And Donovan Mitchell, they have the experience. And I think that um, I think they're going to show up. They show out. I got the Cavs in 6-2. Okay. Jay? It's going to be a rock fight. Like, this yeah. is <clears throat> this is not going to be pleasing to the eye beauty basketball. They're this gonna is going to muck it be, up. Oh, this is two teams, both in the top 10 defensively. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a defensive series. Uh, Cavs are going to have to make shots. It's a lot of what I said last year about the Knicks. And now they have the shooting component that they, they did not have last year. Right. So they got to make shots. Whatever is below NBA TV is where these, like, you're going to have to look for these games on, like, where do they play? Where do they put the NCAA tournament games? Like Hulu. True TV. Yeah, True TV. Oh, this, that's what, this is a True TV matchup right here. So go to that's True also TV. That's like the Crime Network. They may play this at 9 a.m. on Saturday. Like, <laughs> tell me. Tape delay like the 70s. Yes, tape the delay. finals used to be on tape delay of the NBA. Imagine that. Yeah. Hey, y'all are so mean. No, <laughs> y'all like, are so mean. I'm serious, though. Like, well, no outside juice. of Mitchell, the star power is lacking. Um, they and the style it. of basketball is like I agree with you. Yeah. Like if you like up and down a lot of scoring, this isn't for you. No, uh, they Magic do have a form number one overall pick, pretty good player. Paolo Ben Carroll's a stud. Yeah, yeah Paolo Ben Carroll. And and the Cavs don't do well against height, against yeah. size. We there will saw be that. very little mi- limited spacing. We yeah. saw that last year in the Knicks series. The yeah. Knicks pushed him around. We've seen that. I said the Bulls put Andre Drummond in the starting lineup. Because the, the scouting report against the Cavs is you can push these guys. They're big, but you can push them around. 26 rebounds later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, there is some concern there. I mean, Mike and I did the podcast last week, and Mike's like, I don't want any part of the magic. Pablo is, uh, Pablo is one of my favorite players. Man, I do look like this rapper named Yellow Bees. You look him up after the show. <laughs> but we got, some, <laughs> we, got, we got some for Pablo, though. I think, uh, and Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, man, but it seems like every time I've seen the Cavs play at Orlando Magic, Isaac Okoro seems to be able to, you know, be able to play very well against him defensively. Um, you, another thing with Orlando, Jalen Suggs, Suggs is one of the better defensive guards yes, in the NBA. Is. So a hobble Donovan Mitchell matched up against him worries me a little bit. I think their backcourt defensively is one of the best overall in the NBA. There are things there that worry me, but the Cavs are a better three-point shooting team. And the Cavs seem to, I think the Cavs like average 28 assists per game. This season, Orlando was bottom third, 24.4. So if the Cavs can, you know, get the ball movement going, players are hitting shots and they're hitting the threes, I think that's where the Cavs, another area outside yeah. of just experience, where the Cavs have the advantage of. Defense and toughness in the play. I love, I love both in the playoffs. I think you need both to make deep runs. Uh, I do think the Cavs have the defensive element. Um, I just, they, they lack the toughness, and we'll see. They, they said all the right things after the game yesterday. You know about you know we're going to be tough. We're going to take it to them. Uh, let's see. One let's thing see about it, the Magic are going to hear all week. They wanted to play you guys because that's if I'm, exactly right. If I'm their coach, if I'm Jamal Mosley, who is a Cavs former assistant who knows this franchise very well, uh, Jamal's a great guy. I'm very happy for his success. Good. He was in the running here for the job a few years ago, mm-hmm. um, and I'm sure he's going to be telling them all week. Those guys are going to be telling them all week. They wanted you. They wanted you. So and and his motivation is they didn't want me. Yeah. Well. So, yeah. Yeah. We'll see. They yeah. had a chance. They had a chance. Um, he was yeah. here under Byron Mikey, what Scott, do you have? Mike Brown. I want to make one thing very clear. Uh-oh. The Cavs have the best player in the series in Donovan Mitchell. No question. They have a more talented roster, top to bottom. Yep. They have more playoff experience and home court advantage. Uh oh. But there are no excuses not to win the series. I'm serious. No, no I, excuses. I, I agree, but... We knew that going into it, and, and it could happen. It, it's going to be a rock fight. Jared Allen in his post-game interviews yesterday said it's going to be a fight to 85. I went through and watched Orlando's game against Milwaukee yesterday. Jalen Suggs, if you're unfamiliar with how much of a dog he is defensively, you're going to learn very quickly. Yeah. He made Dame Lillard look like he was 65 years old last night. Well, he, is he held him to 2 of 14 from the floor. <laughs> 2 of 14, that's a guy who, without Giannis in the lineup, has been taking over 25 shots a game. Yeah. 
Held him to 14 shot attempts, only made two of them. Him against Mitchell is going to be a hell of a matchup. Bancaro is an absolute monster. And without Dean Wade, they don't have a ton of size on the wings to match up with Paolo, who's a legit 6'10 guy with some strength. It's going to be a rock fight. But at the end of the day, when you strip this down to the bare minimum, <coughs> the Cavs have the best player, a better roster, more playoff experience, and home court advantage. If you check the box in all four of those categories, yeah. I, I, I will hear no excuses. If it doesn't go in the Cleveland Cavaliers' favor and they're not playing Boston or whoever in round two, head's got to roll. I so no so your pick is Cavs in? I will pick the Cavs to win. I have not determined how many games yet. Okay, that's fair. You can get back to us on that. Yeah, we'll do our official predictions on Friday. But I would say the same thing. I, do th- I didn't think the Cavs were going to beat the Knicks last year, but I do think that the Cavs beat, win this series. Uh, and you, that's a great point. We just crushed them for... 35 minutes for setting this up, and now we're all And all three of us like, yeah, Cavs are six. <laughs> no, they're going to win. And, and you know what? Like, in, in this, like, the, the ultimate question before you answer smart or chicken shit, to me, you have to, well, what is your objective? And anybody that says this was smart, they're okay with the team objective being win one series, and that's a good, that's a win. The objective? And, and my objective is No. You didn't, do, you didn't play this season. You didn't make the moves you made. You don't have Donovan Mitchell on here to win a series. You are a team that has aspirations to win a championship. You're a team that went 18-2 and two in a 20-game stretch with the largest margin of victory, average margin of victory, over any team that's ever played and called themselves the Cavaliers, including all of LeBron's teams. That's quite an accomplishment. This is a good team. This isn't a win one series and we're good team. So my objective is win it all. That's the objective. Yeah, see, when I looked at it and when I said that, I didn't look at it as, okay, the Cavs just go win one series and then that's it. I just looked at it as like, you want to put yourself in the best position possible to get the most favorable matchup in the first round. And if you can hit the ground running, then you know what? Let everything else take care of itself. Because you really can't control who your opponent is in round two. We might be looking ahead and nine times out of ten, it's going to be Boston. But Boston still got to make sure that they take care of their business, too. No, that's a fact. So for the Cavs, for me, I looked at it like, okay, this is the matchup that they, see, they look at as the most favorable, favorable matchup for them. Let's get in the playoffs. Let's get this round one win and then take it from there and see what happens. See what happens. The objective, there's some self-preservation going on. There's people trying to protect their jobs. And I hate that part of it. And number two, the bigger objective, get Donovan Mitchell to sign an extension. That's the objective of this postseason. They're not going to win a championship this year. I got news for you. They're not winning a title. So the objective is how do we get Donovan Mitchell to sign to stay here? Okay. Let's talk some Guardians, guys, and we'll do that in one second. But as we do every Monday, if you have not already subscribed to the UCSS newsletter, it comes out every Monday. There's a quick little sample of it on the screen. You can text the number 216 435 1590 to sign up for the newsletter. It is on the bottom of your screen there. If you want to be a part of the newsletter, it tells you what's coming up this week, anything you missed from the week before in the UCSS world, check out the newsletter. The number to text to get part of it, uh, to get added to that newsletter list is right there on the bottom of your screen. Jason, you were at the Guardians game yesterday where they were able to walk off the New York Yankees in 10 innings. The first two games of the series went to New York, so the Guardians were able to salvage one of three, but I want to start with one thing that Jason tweeted out yesterday before we talk about the big picture, the starting pitching, and the walk-off. The cheers for the Yankees, Jason, really pissed you off. Oh, it's nause- it was just nauseating. It happens everywhere. By the way, that home run that Judge hit. Oh, my God. Why did they knock down the distance? It, they, I don't know. I don't because know. Because it was over 450. So, so I was in the press box, and I didn't see where it landed. I thought it was like three-quarters up the bleachers or right. higher. And my, my oldest and my father-in-law who actually had tickets to the game. So they were sitting in the bleachers. So for the last couple of innings, I walked out there, and I was sitting with them for the last couple of innings. And I asked my son, I'm like, where did that land? He goes, Dad, it hit, the, it hit above the bleachers. It hit like the white part of the scoreboard above the bleachers. That's Mark McGuire territory. They, yeah, McGuire hit the Budweiser sign. He's the only one to hit the scoreboard. That's it. And they, at first they said 469, and then StatCast dialed it down to 450. I, and I don't understand It might have been higher than 469. I, think, well, I thought 469 was low. Yeah, based on where my son told me it landed? Yeah, I don't, know, I don't understand how they got that I number. I mean, that was just an absolute bomb. He's Paul Bunyan with a baseball bat. But 
But the cheers for the Yankees just is just infuriating. Now <laughs> I'll put it into perspective. I I was uh, I worked in Tampa from '98 to '03. '98 was their first season. I remember going to their inaugural game. Um, well, Tampa, every really time bad. the Yankees came to town, yes. and I'm not exaggerating this. They, this is when they were drawing. Even in year one, they were drawing like twenty twenty two thousand. Yeah. Yankees would come to town. They'd have the trop would be packed. Yep. And it was seventy five to eighty percent. Yankee fans. But their spring training is there, too. Well, they're right in Tampa. Yeah. And a lot of, obviously, New York transplants live in Florida. (laughs) And it's the chance for them to see the Yankees. And it felt like every Yankee fan went to every single game they played at Tropicana Field (laughs) the entire five years I was there. So it's nauseating. But And I've also been in other stadiums. Where the Yankees are the visiting team, it's just that's what it is. Yeah. It's like, it's you know, the, the team that does that, everybody thinks the Cowboys are the team that's, you know, I think it's the Steelers. It is the Steelers. In the for NFL, sure. when the Steelers yes. are playing wherever they're playing, their fans take over the stadium. Their fans are there yep. in force. And yep. it reminds me of the Yankees. And yep. I hate it too. I'm with you. No one here is old enough to remember Pete Franklin. You might remember the I name. I remember, yeah. But I'm, I'm old enough to remember listening to Pete Franklin. Yeah. And Pete Franklin started something called. The I hate the Yankee hankies. <laughs> <laughs> and they always, I don't know how this worked out on the schedule, but the Yankees were always in town for a doubleheader on the 4th of July weekend. I, I don't know why. It was, it just, I just remember multiple times the Yankees were here over the 4th of July weekend. And often, sometimes they would play doubleheaders. That's yeah. when doubleheaders were much more common. Yep. And 3WE was the radio station that Pete Franklin worked at. And he had a, promotion that he started kind of like um the Steelers long time terrible, towel. terrible towel was Myron Cope started that well the I hate the Yankee hanky became a thing and that was when the municipal stadium would hold 75,000 fans and it would always be full when the Yankees would come to town even though by then the Indians were 14 games out of first place yep. and you'd see 75,000 Yankees hankies flying and those days are gone yep. you know now the Yankees come in and it it, it drives me nuts, too. It drives me crazy. Especially when it reminds me of the it's a sore spot for me because it reminds me of being in that building for Game 7 when the Cubs took over. Yeah. That, yeah. to me, is unforgivable. Yeah. You know? I go back and forth on that because a lot of people made business decisions. I know they, and they did. Made a, a, I get it. People made a ton. Now, you could they say. They paid for next season's yes. season tickets. Yes. But who you, cares? You could say if you can afford season tickets, then you're probably not hurting for the money. You're and not. you should have kept your tickets. Anybody I know that owns season tickets, they're not scraping up that money to go. Right. They right. had a one-off opportunity yep. to, to watch the biggest game, game in the franchise the, yeah. history. I know. Game seven against the Marlins was in Miami. Miami. Yeah. This is literally a once-in-a-lifetime situation. Yeah. yeah. And, you, and, sold and you sold your ticket. I, I'm so conflicted because I say all the time, I'm as pro-capitalist as they come. Make as much money as you <laughs> I can. I am too. And but when you're a fan? Yeah, I know. And that's why I'm so Jason torn Kipnis on took one. a lot of heat for the piece that he wrote. I yeah. think it was a Facebook piece. I don't know that it was published anywhere, but his Facebook page. But he He's pissed. basically, and I thought I had a right to say it to the fans. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where were you when we needed you most? Mm-hmm. You know, and and yet when Rajay hit that home run, oh my that God. stadium shook like I've if, never felt. I bet it, it registered shake. on the Richter scale. Yeah, and and it, and it was half Cubs fans. There's only half Indians fans. No, there. I know, but it was the Indians fans that were there shook that made place so, because it felt like that game was over. Yeah, I mean yeah. Chapman came in and was throwing pills, but we're way off topic. Yeah. Um, I thought. Yeah, how big was the walk-off yesterday? Salvage I, at I, least one of the three games from the game. I'll say this. As big as a win can be... On April 14th. On April 14th. Yeah. And, 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 and I'll, I'll preface <laughs> all of that by saying what matters most is what they do in the next five to seven days. I would have hated to think... By the way, right now it's scoreless in the bottom of the third. Bottom third scoreless. Each um, team is one hit. Cutter Crawford, by the way, uh, twirling the ball for the Red Sox today. He's having a great year. A um, 0.48 ER. Boston, no, he's he's having a great year. Boston's pitching is Boston's pitching really has been good. good. Yeah. Our pitching has been uh, better than I expected. Once Bieber went out, I'm like, oh, God, this is going to go south quickly. But uh, So to answer your original question, it felt like a loss. When they gave <laughs> up the run in the ninth and then the two in the tenth, I'm like, this is just a, this is going to be a sweep, yeah, yeah. and they're going to limp to Boston with their tails between their legs. And I think, and again, I don't want to overstate it because it's the 14th game. It's, it's, it's yes. April 14th. 
so I don't want to make too much of it. However, in a young manager's career, this game is even more pivotal. You don't want to go into Boston, losers of three straight, to the first real team that you've played. Right. I know Minnesota and Seattle better than Oakland um, and Chicago, but it, let's face it, the Yankees are in a different class. And for them to salvage something, and the way they won it, they had every opportunity to just wilt and go away. Yep. And they didn't do that. They came out in that 10th inning, and they were scrapping, and they, they put together the rally. So as big a win as you can have this early in the season, in my view. Yeah, every win over the Yankees just feels a little bit more juice behind it. I, I think, to no, me at least. I left that out. You're right. Yeah, every time you beat the Yankees, there's a little bit more juice behind it. But it is, it's only April 14th, now the 15th. You only see these guys a couple of years. There is so much baseball still to go. And the ultimate grand scheme of things, it doesn't mean anything. But in the moment, sure, yeah. You feel good about these guys. And <laughs> we'll get to it in a minute. The, the pitching, whew. I'm very concerned about the pitching. Yeah, yeah I was uh, I was at the Cavs game yesterday. I didn't see it, but I heard it when I was walking to the garage yeah. in my car. I was just trying to hurry up and get the hell from downtown before everything went crazy. Yeah. Uh, I guess my biggest takeaway is like seeing Jimenez get that hit. Um, it kind of lets me know that he's back offensively. Oh, he's, we already know what he he's does all, defensively. He's, he's having a tremendous he's locked start. In. Yeah. Um, to not get swept by the first real team that you faced this year, I'll take that. Anytime that you can beat the Yankees, that's a plus. I know the doubleheader didn't go all that great. I didn't watch any of the games. I was pretty busy. Jason, I heard it was a play. Uh, I think it was the second game Saturday. The, the Guardians had a chance for, for a triple play, and they came away with this situation with no outs at all. Was that the first inning on Saturday? I, I, I didn't watch so it all. So they had the Somebody bases loaded. There was a hard hit ball to third. No way, no way they're going to get a triple play on that. But the throw to second was high. It brought Jimenez, who, by the way, moments earlier got his uh, gold glove. Yeah. The throw to second was high. He jumped to get it, and his foot was not on the bag when he had the ball in his glove. And his throw to first was in the dirt, and Naylor couldn't dig it out. So you've got Tristan McKenzie on the rope in the first inning with the bases loaded was it and nobody that, out. Was Staten that came up? What's that? Was it Juan Carlos Staten that came uh, up? No. So I'm trying to think who the next hitter was. I missed the first inning. I watched a lot of that game, but I didn't yeah, maybe see the first it was Stanton. Inning. I can't remember. Stanton's their their cleanup hitter, cleanup so hitter. it was Stanton. Yeah. Okay, it was Stanton that came up next. They go so and he got a base judge hit. Stanton. That's insane. <laughs> when, honest to God, it, I felt this way during the playoffs a couple of years ago, but I think their lineup now with Soto, it's it's, it's even better. You it look is. at it, and you're like, this is an all star team. It's unfair. This and by the way, an all star. Their leadoff batter is hitting three fifty, three sixty. Setting the table Volpe, for these shortstop, guys. yeah, and that makes prospect. it that makes it so much easier because now you can't pitch around Judge and Stanton and Soto. That might be that's the murderer's row of the old twenty-seven Yankees. I mean, that's it's that good. I, that might be the best. I mean, Stanton has to stay healthy. Yeah, if, which is always a big if. What does he play like a hundred games a year? It's not better than the Dodgers' big three, though. Otani, Betts, and no, Freeman. I don't, I don't think it is either. I don't but know. The, I think the health part of it is why I would say it's. Yeah, not. I guess. I mean, I would take Soto and Judge over any two you give me. Any. Two. I would too. I, and and that includes over Otani. Betts and Otani. Yes. You were going. Yes. These guys, Soto. First of all, Soto. What I love about him is they showed during the game Saturday the exit velocity for I think it's the top five guys in Major League Baseball, and Judge and Soto were I think second and third, or they're yeah. right there in the top five. He swings the freaking bat like it's a wiffle ball bat. I know. He is yeah. so his wrists yeah. are so yeah. strong. I, I would I would take Soto and Judge over Betsy. And in Otani, that stadium really this would. year, I mean, if he stays healthy, how many home runs can he can oh, he get? Yeah. It's yeah. it's you know, the short porch. But huge win. Uh the pitching, I let's do this. Because I, I actually gave some thought to this. That's how dumb I am. On one to ten, where are you on comfort level with the starting pitching? One being Terrified and 10 being great. Yeah, you're not worried at all. Negative seven and a half. <laughs> I'm not like, that low. I'm really so, concerned. Tristan is not Tristan. Nope. There's just something wrong. I know he was effective in his second start. He could not throw strikes at all. Now, he did settle in a little bit on Saturday. But to me, the, the telling stat for him is ball to strike ratio. I, I know personally myself when, I, when I'm not throwing strikes, it's not because I can't. It's because I don't want to. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to put the ball in the sweet spot of the strike zone mm-hmm. f- because of what's going to happen. And I typically get that way when my arm isn't right. I know, and he knows, he, he was like at 90. 
Yes. In his first start, I think he was in 89. His average fastball was, was 90, 89. 90. And, and that is not... Look, you can't do that today. Right. I don't care how good your curveball is. I don't care how good your changeup is. If your best pitch is coming in there at 90 miles an hour, and he knows that. That's why he had six walks in four innings. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't trust his stuff. Do and you, that's terrifying. Do you think he's regretting not getting the surgery? I think probably he is. I would be if I were him. Uh, it's funny you say that because Zach Meisel and I talked to Tristan for about 20 minutes. Who's one week. of the nicest people you'll Phenomenal. ever meet. Ever. And he's brilliant. He's so smart in the way that he thinks. He's very thoughtful. Pitching. Mm-hmm. And he, he can explain it so well. Uh, but Zach and I talked to him for about 20 minutes. And we haven't. Zach actually wrote a story today. I think it's out today on just pitching the pandemic of, of these arm injuries. Yep. And Tristan was sort of the anchor to, to that piece, and then he and I are coming back with a piece in a couple of days. Did he make a conclusion in his piece? He, well, no, no. I mean, nobody has... I know, nobody knows, but yeah. a, a hypothesis? Like, what were some things that he's putting forward for why we're seeing the number of I mean, it's the same thing. It's possibly the pitch clock, possibly the weighted balls, possibly the sweeper slider. You know, there's so many... And when you put did, them did all together. Did he talk at all about spin rate? Uh, no, not in that piece. I mean, obviously, it's a big, it's a big focus and a big push on yeah. everything. I think that's a, an avenue to explore. Yeah. And you know as well as I do, that's become the catchphrase. Yes. It, it, so for hitting, it was launch angle. Remember? Yep. When analytics bombarded the game, well, what's your launch angle? And guys were literally, well, not guys, baseball. They were changing the way they swing the bat. You know, it used to be down on the ball, create backspin and lift. Yep. All of a sudden, what worked for 100 years is Swing no up. good anymore. Swing up. Now it's, nope, you want to come through the plane with a launch angle. Yep. Okay, great. And, I mean, J.D. Martinez rejuvenated his entire career. And look. He was it, one of the first guys to do it, and he made a ton of money I remember doing talking to Josh Bell about this in spring training last year, and he literally said, I'm not sure... Because he was a guy, when you watched him swing, his swing looked like a rusty gate. He looked like his hands were backwards. And the reason it looked, the reason he looked so off, he told me this. He said, everybody's preaching launch angle. It might work for some guys. It's just not working for me. Yeah. My focus this year is going to be line drives. Now, I'm wondering if the Guardians didn't get to him and say, no, 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 no Josh. That's not the way we're doing it. You need, we're, launch angle. We're, we're preaching launch well, angle. They, they, because he had no success here. Yeah. And I know it, he told me he was going back to a level swing and he wanted more line drives. But I didn't see that from him. I saw the same hitch up. Right, right. And then he goes to Florida and or Miami and the Marlins probably just left him the hell alone and he started tearing the cover off the ball. Yeah, he, he definitely got better. And so Miami. the reason I bring spin rate up is, look, I just experiment with this stuff because I like to... It's, it's, I like to do it. I'd like to consider myself sort of a scientist when it comes with the baseball. I like to experiment. I've, I, I tried inventing pitches. I literally have. It didn't work, but I tried it. <laughs> but when spin rate became the thing, I'm like, you know, I have no way of measuring my spin rate. I don't have that equipment. But I know when, when a ball tumbles out of my hand, and I know when a ball comes out what I call whistling. And, and you can feel it. You just yeah. And it all has to do with pressure and also arm slot and yep. launch and everything else. And I don't know that that isn't what's leading. Everybody's chasing that number. Everybody. And the spin rate in baseball has gone up exponentially. And I'm just wondering, to spin it, your, your flexor tendon and your UCL are becoming more dominant in the, in the delivery of the baseball. You're, you're enacting and using those parts of your arm more than you are your shoulder. Yeah. And I don't know what the breakdown is, but it seems to me totally anecdotal. I'm reading about elbows everywhere. Absolutely. And it used to be shoulders. Not to mention taking away the sticky stuff. That had a big, big impact Puts on Puts more it. pressure on. It used to be you would hold it like an egg, and you would hold it real soft when you threw it. Now these guys grip it. Oh, they're it. death grip. It, yeah. Yep. It, you throw it as hard as you can, and you grip it as hard as you can. Getting back to Tristan, whether or not he regrets it, he didn't say... He didn't really say, he said, like, I don't want to give away the whole piece because it hasn't run yet, but he said, like, you just don't know. Mm-hmm. Like, you take all the information, and he did have, like, he consulted with an outside doctor who said, have the surgery. And he talked to other doctors who, to said, that, Jason. who said, you can pitch through it. 
Who were the other guys? Do we know our guys? He, I'm sure he talked to the team doctors. Yeah, and they they said you could. Well, the, it. The, he said the <clears throat> team doctors leave it up to you. Like the team leaves it up to the pitcher. It's the pitcher's call whether you're going to have the surgery. And that's or not. Fair. ultimately, yeah, it's the, how it should be. It should ultimately be. it's your decision. You take in all the information and you do with it what you want. And the location of the tear has to do with whether or not you can pitch through it or not. The higher up it is. Mm-hmm. The better the odds you can pitch through it. Right. The lower it is. You're right. You got to have the surgery. So his is higher up toward the humeral head. I'm giving away a lot of the story here. I just said I wasn't going to. And 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 ultimately, because I said I told him I was like, if I were you, and I don't have a long term contract, I would have the surgery. Get the money. Everybody's having the surgery. Everybody has the surgery. Yep. It's not that big of a deal anymore. Oh. Have the surgery. Some guys that don't rehab. need it ask for it. Brian Shaw said that. Brian's like, hey, can I have the surgery? Can <laughs> You're I get, not alone. Can I get a two-year you know contract? You if, you, if I have Tommy John, can I get a two-year contract? <laughs> you got one of those Tommy <laughs> I don't know that it's still an issue, but when my son was playing high school baseball, his team had a number of kids that mm-hmm. were big-time Division One prospects. Mm-hmm. None of them pitched in the major leagues. One of them advanced pretty far through the minor leagues. I knew an orthopedic surgeon in my town, and he knew that I pitched, and he'd asked me about injuries that I'd had. And he said, you know what kids are asking for? I've got parents of 16 and 17-year-old boys That's coming in saying, can you give my son Tommy John? Because you'll add two or three miles. You'll add velocity. Yeah. He'll get a scholarship. Yeah. It'll be worth it in the long it's run. Crazy. Even if he doesn't make it to the pros, yeah. that extra velocity is going to get him a college scholarship. And thankfully, because I like this guy, and this guy had two incredibly athletic children. In fact, one of his kids was the one that advanced way deep into the minor leagues. Mm-hmm. He said, he said, that's unethical. I would never, ever do that. But I'm sure if you look around enough, oh, for you sure. can find a doctor that will gladly do and take your $30,000 yeah. and do the surgery. There was a reliever for the White Sox that had jokingly said in the past, I'm trying to tear my UCL <laughs> so that I can get a brand new one. So, get a, so I can throw harder. I can come yep. back and throw harder. It's, it's amazing. I, I've, I've watched the Guardians this year. I guess for me, from a casual standpoint, my nerves is not that bad about the starting pitcher right now. It's not what I'm used to seeing from this team, but I do know it's April and there's a lot of baseball to be played. I remember a stretch where Logan Allen and Tyner, Tyner Bybee Got extremely hot during the summer uh, last year. So I'm expecting that this year, hopefully we get Gavin Williams back soon. Try what to, are you like, hearing about Williams? You know, try to get that corrected. A couple weeks? But. Yeah, he just started throwing. He just started a throwing program. I think he'll be back in a couple of weeks. I thought um, uh, Curry was further away. No, yeah, he pitched in He pitched in AAA. I knew they pitched him in AAA, start. but I, th- I, th- I thought, well, they're going to want to stretch him out because they're going to need him to be a starter. Is he still on the mound for them? I don't know. I mean, I, I they're think in the he bottom is right of the- now. Okay, so still he's still in there. It's bottom of the zero. fourth. I don't know how many pitches he threw in that start for uh, Columbus in his last start, but um, it was fifty-eight. It was so he's probably. I mean, he's not he's stretched at forty-five out. pitches right now, and he's through the fourth. So and I would he threw stretch fifty-eight, it. Mike, in Columbus. Yeah, I'd give him sixty-five 70? to seventy yeah. today, yeah. and if that's the case, at this rate, he could get through the sixth. That would be which huge. would be absolutely <laughs> now the, the Guardians aren't hitting. And that's a problem. Who's pitching for Boston today? Cutter? Cutter Crawford. Crawford. And he's having a he's having like an all star type they're season. They're all like their their rotation. They didn't spend any money. They took a lot of heat. Boston did. I know they did. For yeah. Trading Chris Sale, not spending a lot of money, but they're investing in their young pitchers and so far, I mean it's early, but so far it's yeah. working. But the Guardians, I think Bybee will be okay. We mentioned I mentioned it the other day. I do too. I mean I'm not he, worried about he's him. He's been hit hard, but I, I think he'll be fine. I do too. Gavin Williams should be back in a couple of weeks. Hopefully he's the Gavin. That's why I'm surprised you're a negative seven. Because there's no Bieber. I don't think I, at the rate we're going, I don't think Tristan lasts the season. I think he's going to have to have the surgery. I, I, I agree at with the you. Rate we're going, and now Which you is just why lost. I'm, I'm, I'm only a four. And that so you just lost your two most biggest anchors. The two the that staff. you lost last year when you lost 70, uh, 86 games. Yeah, and and I I mean I said earlier a couple last week or a couple weeks ago I thought Bybee was the ace of the staff. Just because I I don't I don't know you can count on Tristan at the rate I hope I'm wrong, like you, there are guys that have pitched and Tanaka is the most obvious example of right. the Yankees who pitched with a torn ligament. Aaron Nola is another one in Philly who came back throwing harder. He has he never got it repaired, never got it surgically repaired, and d- came back throwing harder. So, but the way I mean, this is off to a rough start, obviously with Tristan, and the, by no means are they out of the woods because he's made it back to this point. No Bieber, no Tristan. They don't have the next wave coming 
of young arms. Yeah, Zavian, no, Zavian they got here fine. last year. Yeah, I mean, Zavian Curry's okay, but he's not in the class of Gavin Williams and Tanner Bybee and these guys. And, I mean, they're already relying on Carlos Carrasco far more than they were anticipating. Right. Like, I mean, Carrasco and At times, was, he's looked pretty good. He, he has. Like, he's... But, but he does it a different way now. He's not the same pitcher. No, Carrasco was, Carrasco was brought here as a feel-good story to maybe earn the final bullpen spot. Yeah. And now he's – and he's going to be in the rotation for a while. Like, he's not going anywhere. No one's coming. So – The cavalry's here. Yeah, so I'm, I am very concerned. Uh, if, if Gavin Williams comes back and, settle, and settles this down a little bit, if Bybee gets back into rhythm, I'll feel a little bit better. But and, no, and, McKen- and this is the biggest if. If Tristan can – Hump up his fastball and look. Did yeah. he say he's pitching in any pain? No pain at all. I asked him that. But he, he said it's always in the you back know, of my head. What's fascinating, I was just going to say this, Jason, what is so fascinating to me is the psychology of sport. We've talked about it a million times. I'm going to throw Wednesday for the first time. Mm-hmm. I've done drills. Um, uh, like there's a drill where you reach back and the therapist throws a ball and you catch it. And you pull yeah. all the way down. You don't let go. You don't throw it. But it's a catch. Catching, and yeah. what you're doing, they're working on the brakes. Yeah. They're working on the sudden stop at the end because <clears> that causes a lot of arm damage. I can tell you right now, I, am, I have been thinking about either with concern or excitement Wednesday for, since the surgeries yeah. for, for, for a month. Yeah. And I am so terrified as to what's, how it's going to go. What's, what, how's it going to feel? And yeah. I don't have tens of millions of dollars on right, the line. Right. It's just my passion and what I love to do more than anything in the world. Yep. So going into Wednesday, I don't know what I'm going to feel like when the ball is in my hand and I'm looking at the ball that the catcher and Smith, where I'm going to throw. I have no idea. But when I'm watching him, I'm looking at him saying, he either is in pain, and you're telling me he's not, and I believe you, if he, if I believe him if he right, told you that. Right. I think it's all mental then. He's afraid to let it go Well, for his, what might happen. He said it's in the back of his head, but he said when I'm on the mound, I'm not worried about my arm. I'm trying to get guys out. I know you are, but... But here's the thing. If you look at the metrics on where Tristan's at, the fastball velocity is down Way significantly. Down. From go back, you got to go back two years because he was hurt all last year. Right. Shoulder, I was elbow. That. Like, what, what? you got to go back to two years okay. ago. And oh, his fastball was electric. And not only that, guys aren't chasing like the ch- his nope. chase rate, especially the Yankees. His chase rate is through the floor. Yep, he can't get guys to chase anymore, and they are hammering his fastball. But the chicken or the egg in in hitting guys aren't chasing because he's not throwing strikes. Yeah, yeah. and so like it's one thing to live on the edges like a Greg Maddox did. Right, um, guys learn very quickly. Oh, he's going to get that call. I've got to chase. But if he's not, he's not throwing the ball in the sweet spot. He's not throwing the ball on the edges. Yeah, he's missing by a lot. Yeah. I, what, I, I watched him Saturday, and I'm just like, I don't even recognize him. Yeah. And I feel so badly for I don't, him. I do, too. Because he didn't get that big payday. And if the rumors were right, he was next to sign his extension. Oh, he was hours. He was a day away, maybe. He was hours from signing. Oh, my God. I, I, Mike, 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 before you move on, I'll be damned if I'll ask this question because I'm, I'm sitting here with some baseball gurus, right? So last week he gave us a topic of possible replacements for Shane Bieber. Start doing some research, trying to figure out guys. And this particular guy that's currently on the team, Tyler Beatty, mm-hmm. what I do know, 2014 first round pick of the Giants, yeah. didn't really pan out as a starter there. He's been great for the Guardian since he's been here and was actually credited for the win uh, yesterday. If everything else goes to fail, nobody else seems to step up and, you know, really show that they can be a productive starter. What's the chances that this dude gets an opportunity to be like your fifth starter? The opportunity, I think he'll get the opportunity, but... I, he's a Vandy guy, right? I'm pretty sure he's a Vanderbilt yeah, guy, so. and so was Vote. And I felt like he's floated around. He never lived up to his, his hope. And to me, I almost felt like, oh, Vote's doing him a solid because he's a Vandy guy. Mm-hmm. And not to say he doesn't believe in him, but he's, you know, he probably said, hey, you know, let's take a look at him, see what we got. Just like you said, Carrasco was intended to be a feel-good story, and now he's like, oh... <laughs> Grab a grab a ball and a glove because you're we need grab you. an axe and a hose. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> Help us put out the fire. Yeah, I think that's exactly what we're looking at here. Um, not you know he's, he has been better than I thought he would be. Yeah, but I don't know how a guy changes his stripes in his tenth yeah, professional season. Yeah, I don't know that he would be. I think he'd be pretty far down on the list in terms of a starting option. I'd much rather look at a nineteen or twenty year old prospect. 
I was just curious. Like I said, listen, if you're going to lose, let's get some miles on the tires. Let's, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I know that can damage a pitcher's psyche, but the guy's been around for 10 years. Yeah. And there's a reason that he hasn't stuck. Well, they're, I mean, Xavier Curry is going to get the first, he'll get the longest look. And they're still obviously building him up. They got to stretch him out. Um, but, I mean, Bybee, for now, you got to count McKenzie. McKenzie, Bybee, Williams, uh, Allen. Cookie, Allen, yeah. And then Xavier Curry. Is in there. Yeah, Williams is coming. Xavier Curry's on, on deck if somebody else goes down. But um, I, I was just, like I said, just curious from, from where I stand. I, yeah, know. I think he's low on the list of, of guys. One guy who's impressed me is Hunter Gaddis. I never liked yeah. him as a starter. I didn't either. He's not but bad as a reliever. Cow. He's been really good. Yeah. He's cool. been good. And Smith had a great first appearance. Not so much in his, because Cade Smith. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Big, yeah. tall kid, throws yeah. hard as hell. Yeah. Um, I like him. Yeah. I think, you know, he might have had some jitters. Probably didn't have enough time to think about it, and it was against the A's yep. in his first start. But yep. in his second start, I think he threw it. He wasn't nearly as effective yeah. and struggled to throw strikes. But we'll see. Right now, they're in the fifth. Nobody on, one out. Guards Still no hitting. score? Still no score. Wow. Three yeah. hits total, only one for the guards, and it was Gabriel Arias who yeah. had a triple. Off and they left him stranded. How about real Juan quick before we move on? What about Esteban Florial? I, I, I texted Meisel when he started both games of the doubleheader. Yeah. I told Zach, this feels to me like get your licks in now because Manzardo's coming. I thought they were getting ready to move on from him. I mean, I have no backing on that, no knowledge of that. But the guy didn't play, and then all of a sudden he shows up in both games of the doubleheader. I kind of felt like this was – and he's like taking advantage of it. Well, he had a home run. And, and he played well again yesterday. I Is wonder if that had anything to do with the fact that, that, you know, it's always interesting to watch a team, uh, watch a player go against a team that gave up on him. Yes. For some reason, I, I don't know if, if, I wish you could find out what all major league hitters yeah. at batting average and stats are yeah. against yeah. their old teams. Old teams. Um, so I don't know if that, that was going on. Is he in the lineup today? He is in the lineup today. Yeah. So, so far today, he is 0 for 2. 0 for 1, he is, he's at bat right now. Oh, yeah, he is. At the plate as we speak. Yeah. So, I don't know. I'm just I'm, – Struck out in his first – When yep. I was there, I felt like they really were pushing for him to win that starting job in center field. They wanted it. They were and hoping then, he could. And then Freeman sort of came out of nowhere. And Tyler's had some bad luck. Like, his numbers don't look great, but he's really – He's hit the, the ball, ball hard and made he's some loud outs. Yeah. But he's below 200 now. Yeah, which I know. Which is concerning. Yeah, but I'm t- I, I think it's been more bad luck than – He just struck I think out. He, like, Josh Naylor got off to a terrible start last year by the they numbers. But Josh was hitting it really well. He just had a lot of bad luck. And then you saw that flip as we got a little bit more to the season. Hopefully it's the same way. I actually really like Tyler Freeman. I think he'd be a great two-hole hitter if he gets going. Yeah, I like him too. It's it, uh, I think he's done a really good job in center field. For when learning you ask a, a guy to learn, that, that's not just any position. Like, that's a really, really difficult position yeah. to play. Yeah. And outside of a ball early on in the first game against Seattle, where he kind of overchased it, mm-hmm. um, he's, he's made most of the plays yeah. that I've expected him to make. Yeah. I, I forgot how good... Jimenez was last year. They showed his his uh, oh, highlight reel phenomenal. when they were talking about his gold glove before the game Platinum. he presented. Yeah. Platinum. Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, he's entering, dare I say, he is in Omar Vizquel, oh, Ozzie yes. Smith. Yes. Ter- I know. I Ronnie know. Alomar. No, he is but defensive. He makes now, some he's plays. Doing it at second. He, I think he'd be just as good at short. I do, too. But he's in the too. Robbie Alomar at second base as far as I'm concerned. 100%. Robbie, Robbie's the best defensive second baseman I've ever seen. And I agree lifetime. with that. I'll second that. Yeah. yeah. And, but I think that Jimenez, with his size and his range, would be just as good at short as he is at second. Did I tell you, I don't know if you were here the day, when I came back from spring training, I think I mentioned this, he's a natural left-hander. He's a lefty who taught himself to throw right-handed because he wanted to catch. He loved catching. That's insane. He, when he was a kid, he loved being a catcher, and he wanted to catch. So he can throw the ball well with his left hand. Oh, yeah. He's left-handed. You know, that explains that play he made last year where he dove in the hole and flipped it with his glove hand yeah. almost like in real – it was just like boom-boom, and yeah. it was out, and they got the force at second. Because he's left-handed. That makes sense. He I did not his, know that. He taught himself to throw right-handed because he – and not because to be a middle infielder – but because he loved catching so much, he wanted to be a catcher. So he taught himself to throw. Because that's no a rare skill set. It's unbelievable. You're, what I, I love throwing left-handed. Like whenever I go bowling, I like to throw a couple of uh, frames left-handed. Yeah, yeah. 
I also like to play catch left-handed. I don't do it a lot, but when I do it, you really have to think about the mechanics. Oh, I look awful. And picking your leg up yeah. and, and coming back yeah, and over the it. top and releasing. You're thinking about every single part of yep. that process. Yep. So think about it. He's throwing opposite-handed in games when you've got no time to think about anything. Yep. That's, that's impressive. If you watch him, if you're, at, if you're ever at the game, watch him. A lot of times when they're doing infield in between innings or whatever, he'll, like soccer ball, flip it, and he does it all with his left foot because he's, he's a natural dominant. lefty. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, Floriel got out, and we are going to move on Brown to some Brown stuff here. But first, passion, drive, and patience. That's the winning formula for championships. It's also what helps keep your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home some big wins. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. We are a week and a half away from the NFL draft. The Browns do not pick till number 54, but that will not stop us from enjoying mock draft Mondays. We used ESPN's draft simulator for this round of mock drafts and Earl. <laughs> You're up first. How did you think the Browns' mock draft fell when you ran it through ESPN's mock draft simulator? I thought my draft was pretty solid. I went best player available at positions of need that I thought the Browns had. I don't know if you have it up there. So you didn't draft by position. You drafted best available. I just drafted best available well, player. You know, um, Chris, Chris Broswell, for example, 40, uh, ranked 42nd player, 42nd ranked player in the draft, getting him at 54. The Browns really don't have much depth at the linebacker position. Michael Hall, junior defensive tackle from Ohio State. Anytime that you can get a Buckeye in, in a Cleveland Browns uniform, I think all the fans is for that. Uh, MJ Devonshire, you know, Greg, Greg Newsom, fifth-year option is a thing that'll be picked up, but the cornerback position would probably be a position to need, maybe a season or two, so a guy that you can you know, kick the can down the road on. Uh, Javion Cohen, is a combo offensive lineman. We all know Andrew Berry loves versatility on the offensive line. And then in typical Andrew Berry fashion, I went and got a, a wide receiver late. <laughs> 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 so that, that was my draft. But I, I went best position available for each pick. So that was what I did. Interesting. Jason, you're up next. Well, this didn't go the way I wanted it to when, when Mike first told me because I really I say all the time that like I just think the Browns take receivers too late and they need to widen the target and take a receiver early so I had intended to try and take a receiver in the second round but when I did the the simulation Jonathan Brooks was there who might be the best running back in the entire draft and so I had to jump on that uh, because just the uncertainty with Nick Chubb and the uncertainty beyond this year and Brooks played in an RPO style in Texas, had a one really good year, tore his knee up. Brooks wasn't available in the, in the draft I did. Oh, he well, was, it was a simulator, so it depends. Yeah, on I'm just score. saying, like, he was, it wasn't, I don't know when he went, but he wasn't available. Yeah, well, he was available in mine, and, uh, and I told Mike, I took the running back from USC. FSU, Trey Benson. I'm sorry, yeah, from Florida State. And he said, yeah, a lot of people are mocking him to that. And I looked at him like, oh, wait a minute, no, it was the guy from Texas, Jonathan Brooks. Only because, like, like I said, he had one year as a starter. They've obviously had a ton of good running backs come through there with Bijan Robinson and the rest. And I just he played an RPO style system. I think he would fit well here and maybe could be a long term replacement, um, depending on what happens with Chubb. And then, I mean, in the third round, Brendan Rice. That's royalty right there. That's Jerry Rice's kid. So here we go again with another third round receiver now, for the Browns. I had said a couple of weeks ago I would take Brendan Rice in the third round, and you would said, "Oh, he's mocked fifth or sixth round." I still think that's way too low for him. I'm just, I don't scout these dudes. I'm I know, but is, to be has, a his, scout. has his stock risen collectively? Because I, I see there he's ranked 80th and you took him 85th. So I, I, I'll, I, pull, I, I'll pull up a bunch of different. I love that pick. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of making fun of myself taking a receiver in the third round for the Browns, given their lack yeah, of success. Yeah, the last thing you want to do is. But I mean, Jerry Rice, Jerry Rice's kid, there's some genes there at least. And. 
I, there's some there's some talent and ability there, obviously. Uh, so, I mean, that, that seemed like an easy one. And now, after that, and plus also I kind of had the feeling of you're trying to just, if this is all about Deshaun and giving Deshaun as many weapons as you can, well, then you better load up with a running back or receiver. I don't know how, we talked the other day, I don't know how many rookies you, they actually can carry on their 53. It's not that many. Three, maybe four? Yeah. So I, I just went all special teams after the first two picks. Uh, oh, for diverse guys that can give you that Guys diversity. that can help you on special teams. Yeah. Uh, Maris Leofau from Notre Dame uh, could be a JOK replacement down the road, possibly. Plays like his hair's on fire. Um, you know, and then beyond that. Wait, I, where the hell is JOK going? Well, he's in last year of his contract. You think they're yeah, gonna, but. Uh, yeah, I don't know if they're going to pay for a linebacker. Well, well typically this franchise does. Doesn't so do that. I, I just, and I'm not saying that guy's. You know, I don't know if they're drafting his replacement now, but I'm just saying, if he's in the last year of his deal, I don't know if they're bringing him back. I don't know if they're going to value linebacker or not. They don't. Yeah, I don't know if they're going to pay big money. I don't know. I I have no idea right now what t- type of deal he could command. Like I have paid zero attention to the going rate on young linebackers. But if he puts up another monster year... Well, the league in general, as a trend, has devalued them. But it's funny. When you look at the teams that do really well, they're they're stalwarts at linebacker. I mean, ask the Ravens. Look at San Francisco. Ask the Ravens. Look at the Ravens. San Francisco about the importance of linebacker. I mean, they laugh that the rest of the league has devalued them. And part of that, I think, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think part of that is Mr. Moneyball thinks that linebacker is like a utility infielder. I don't know. I, I feel like... He's driving the bus on the yeah linebackers are a dime a dozen, and they're not. Well, in in Jim Schwartz's system, it's the, it's a devalued position. Jim focuses most of the attention on the line. I, I get that, and then the secondary, and then the linebackers. Yeah. So it's 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 not even just De Podesta. It, that, that was explained early on to me with Schwartz's system. It's very much defensive line wreaking havoc, causing chaos on that defensive Heavy line. Heavy rotation, keep yeah. them fresh. I, and then I get the that. secondary, and, and then the linebackers. And I, I still, if I'm prioritizing the groups, I'm still going line, back end, middle. Yeah. But I think the gap between two and three and prioritizing is way too big. Like, I, I think it's decidedly you got to be strong up front. Yeah. I, I think that is by far the most important unit. Yeah. But then I think the back end and the middle are close. Yeah. I'm still going to prioritize the back end because it's a passing league. But with the advent of the tight ends running routes and matching up against linebackers, you can be exposed real quickly yeah. if your linebackers suck. Yeah, absolutely. And so with that in mind, by the way, uh, all, of all the players that were drafted, and what do they have, six picks? Uh, six picks. Um, five. Six, five picks. Five. So 15 players were drafted in our mocks. We didn't have the same guy. Nobody, nobody had the same guy. That's well, Jay, you ready for yours? Steve yeah, throw mine up there. Yep. I went wide receiver. I went Ricky Pearsall just because. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very upfront here. The talent that I know coming out are from the games that I watch. Sure. So I feel really comfortable assessing the skill set of the Big Ten players yeah. and of the players from the blue chips at the other schools. Yes. Um, I did see Ricky Pearsall enough to say I think he can get separated. I think he can be an NFL wide receiver. He was available. I don't know if he was available for you guys. I took him. He was, because I looked at that. Yeah. I looked at that. And I was, it's funny, you always say you win in the margins. Yeah. I don't want the Browns waiting to the third round to draft a wide receiver, because apparently that's too late for them. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. I'm with you. I wanted to take a receiver, but and then the I saw the running you got back. Brendan Wright, like, the fact that he's there. Yeah. Um, and look, he could flame out just because his dad is the all-time greatest to ever do it. Yeah. Does not mean that he's going to have success? Correct. But I like his chances. Just like when I factor in Marvin Harrison, yeah. I have to factor in who his dad is. Yeah. You know? So I, I think that that's a big part of it. Also, uh, Jerry's work ethic was, was like Walter Payton-esque. Yes. Um, he was very famous <clears throat> for taking care of his body and playing into his 40s. And so I just, I, I just tend to think that that is a trait that's passed down work ethic, mm-hmm. and uh, so I, I like that because that, that's an immeasurable. Mm-hmm. You don't know what that is unless you just interview everybody. My, third, uh, my second pick in the third round, um, I, I, I have to be honest with you, I don't know Cedric Gray. <laughs> if he walked in right now with his uniform, I'd, be, I'd say, who are you? Yeah. I don't know him. He was the highest linebacker available in my there mind. There you go. So I said, I, as a, as a fan and as an observer, think that the Browns have undervalued that position too, too much. 
I understand you're devaluing it, but I think we've just been like, oh yeah, and who do we got to play linebacker? Yeah, bring those three in. Yeah. They're our linebackers. I don't think I don't think you win that way. So I went with the highest available linebacker because I do think those are our areas, two areas of greatest need. Then I I'm terrified of our offensive line. Yes. We, that is a real, real weakness. So with picks five or three and four in the fifth and sixth round, I went with a couple of linemen. Again, if these guys spit in my face, I wouldn't know who they were. Yeah. They were the highest av- available linemen, so I took them. And then um, Harold from Michigan, I just remember watching him and him being an impact guy um, when I did watch Michigan. And I-, I went back to linebacker, so I'm really big on – there are three weaknesses to me, a wide receiver, line, uh, offensive line, and linebacker. Yeah. So I load it up, and we'll see what happens. I, it's funny because going into it, I wanted offensive tackle, guard. I, I keep saying, like, you can't keep paying these guards $17 million. No. But Tony was getting older, and you're going to have to make choices here. So, like, my intention <clears throat> was a receiver in the second round, take guards, maybe tackle, because I agree. Like, I don't know what's going on with Jed Wills on the fifth-year option. What happens after that? DeJuan, you're always going to be concerned about injuries with him because he's just so massive. Yeah. So you're always going to be worried about knees, ankles, that sort of thing. Sure. So, and, and yet, then I come out of it with none of those guys. Yeah. See, it's funny because... You got blinded by the light. I, I was looking so, for one. But I kind of went with Earl of just best, taking best available. Best available. Yeah, see, yeah. And that's, that's kind of like my thinking. I want a wide receiver too, but when the draft simulator, the way it fell, um, no wide receivers was available at said picks that, that I felt liked. like that I liked, that mm-hmm. I felt like I wasn't reaching for. And so when I seen Chris Broswell from Alabama, okay, Alabama linebackers tend to uh, play pretty well in the NFL. And out of all the positions on the Browns roster, linebacker seems to be the one with the least amount of depth to it. Yeah. Um, I kept trying to find a wide receiver each round. I said, you know what? I'm not going to force it. And so I just started looking ahead to next year. The Browns got all their draft picks next year. You guys like guys like Ibuka who's coming out. Travis Hunter from Colorado will probably be coming out. So just like it's a lot of top draft prospects at wide receiver this year, I think the wide receiver position coming out of college next year will be strong to where if the Browns and Andrew Berry don't get the coveted wide receiver they want this year, don't force it. Draft depth, draft best, best player available. Right. And you yeah. can go get your home one wide receiver in the draft next year. Because if you're telling me like – as bad as we know, like, guys wanted Marvin Harrison Jr., probably no shot at that. But if you got a shot at a Travis Hunter and then Ibuka has a good year at Ohio State this year and he's coming out next year, I'm cool with that as well. Yeah, yeah you'd have to finish poorly, though, this year to get a wide receiver, one of those top wide receivers. You know, you're going to need a draft pick. Yeah, and I mean, we'll they, have our first-round pick next year, though. We have it, but right. it, if, if, you, if you go – if you win a playoff game, you're picking 24th. In the 20s. But you'll still get a pretty. But you'll still receiver. get a pretty good wide receiver yeah, because they typically. The the no, you're not going to get. You know the, the the difference makers this year will be off the well, board. We, by we 10. think that because you got to think back to when Justin Jefferson was drafted. I think he was like the 18th pick of the draft. Yeah, that was a weird draft, though. Yeah. So I, I mean, it's a, you you'll get a solid wide I receiver. I want to ask you a question. One. So in all your years doing this and in talking to general managers and uh, experts that have covered the draft, because I really think of all of the NFL experts, yeah. the the guys that I put the most stock in are the draft guys mm-hmm. because they're so immersed in it. And it's kind of one lane to be. They don't have to be, you know. They don't. Yep. Um, do you find that there is a more predominant theory or a more successful theory between best available and drafting to your needs? I think it depends on the team. And full disclosure, like, I think, I mean, I'm biased, obviously. I work at The Athletic. I think Dane Brugler is the best out there. Unbelievable. The he's beat, coming on yeah. next Monday, bud. Oh, really? Monday wow. Monday Tuesday, but he's coming on next week for the draft. Local guy. Great. And that's not why. I mean, go go find the beast that yeah. he puts out. Yeah. I'd put him up against Kuiper or anyone else that ESPN has. Yeah. Dane does an unbelievable job. Well, some of those job. guys are living on reputation. I literally yes. was reading him this morning before I came downstairs. The detail that he has, and I, I used and the amount, his... the the information he has. Yes. Yeah. And they like the family backgrounds on all of these guys. The yeah. detail that he goes into, I, I hope that we keep him for another 15 years. I, I'm afraid ESPN's going to steal him from no, us. No, I think a t- He's I, sensational. I, 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 if I'm a team, yeah. you know, Mel Kuyper famously tells the story that years ago, the Baltimore Ravens offered him a job. Mm-hmm. He's a Baltimore guy. Yeah. And it was really, it, it was a difficult decision for him. Because, but he said, ultimately, I'm undefeated in this year. Yeah. I yeah. don't have to, I don't have to, I don't have to, um, 
you know, my record comes and goes. Mike Mayock looked a lot better on NFL <laughs> Network than he did. <laughs> I was just going to go to Mayock. <laughs> he he looked really smart until he did it in, until he in, had to do in it. reality. Yep. Um, I, so I'm fascinated by those two competing theories. Yep. I've talked to a lot of general managers. I've talked to a lot of our former ESPN experts. Yeah. And it's I don't even it's so close. I don't know that I can say. Oh, and to me, it's definitively draft a need. But I do feel like there is a slight advantage in both success rate in reality, and also what the experts think you should do. Mm-hmm. It's more. I believe, and I don't know what it is, 55, 45, but I do believe that drafting to need and not best available is both the most utilized and the most effective of the two. It depends on the team. It depends. If you have a, I mean, obviously, if you need a quarterback, how many teams have we seen miss on first round quarterbacks because well, they were so desperate? It's the for hardest the position to forecast. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes your need is so glaring. It's clear what you have to do. I agree. And then there's franchises like the Steelers and the Ravens that just, I mean, back in the day, the Steelers just drafted linebackers in the first round every year. They didn't need them. They just drafted another one. Right. And they just kept cranking Four them years out. later, no new contract for you, you next up. That's exactly <laughs> it. That's how they did it. And, and it was unbelievable, the machine that they would just crank through there because they just took the best guy. And the better teams that don't have the glaring holes, and I would put the Browns in this category, mm-hmm. can afford to draft best available. Because you don't have that glaring need. You're, the Browns aren't going to this draft going, oh, my God, we got to find a second receiver to pair with Amari Cooper. And, and now, you're, now you're really pigeonholing yourself into what you have to do. But there's other teams out there with holes all over the place. The Carolina Panthers, they're drafting on need. There's no question that they're looking at needs and they're drafting on needs. But the teams, it's almost like the teams at the bottom of the draft are the better teams that are better positioned to just take the best talent that's in front of them. The Browns don't need a cornerback. Maybe well, they take I, a cornerback. I like that you said it, it, it depends on the team because the answer that I got from the Kuypers and all of the experts, McShay, the, the, what they used to say is when you're at the bottom, you need everything. Yes. Yeah. So you're just going to take the best available Yeah. because odds are whatever position that player plays, you need one. Well, yes and no. I mean – if you if if you have holes at three or four different spots, but you got a big time receiver, are you really going to take another big time playmaking well, receiver? But the odds are, if you've got a big time receiver, you're not picking first. I mean, it, y- yeah, you, you know, like typically the teams that pick first suck everywhere. And plus, the NFL I think is a different beast than any other sport because there's so many more injuries. Yeah, you can't build on draft after Just draft because, like you can in baseball. Aside from quarterback, because I, if you have a franchise quarterback, you're not probably taking another quarterback in the first round. But aside from quarterback, unless you're the Packers, there are so many injuries <laughs> that you just can't count on, well, we have this star here, because he could be yeah. gone tomorrow like that. Yeah. It, just, it just feels good in this city to be light years removed from looking for a rookie to be the saving grace, yeah. right? We talk all the time about the Browns need a receiver, the Browns need a receiver. This is not 2011 when you're looking at Greg Little to come in here and be your saving Greg grace Little. on offense, My right? Lord. Or or Brian Rabisky or or on defense and Cameron Wembley, et cetera. I can remember so many different Cleveland Browns drafts to where as a fan, it's like, okay, this first round pick or this second round pick, I'm depending on this dude to change the fortunes of the Cleveland Browns yeah. franchise. Yeah. And to see how this thing has been organically built out, the culture that's changed, the depth on the roster, the talent on this roster, to where you can go into this draft in 2024 and know, okay, we need guys for depth. We need guys that might be, you know, priority or rotational players down the road, two or three seasons down the right. road. It feels good from a fan perspective to be in that position for the Cleveland Browns versus what we're used to. Free agents, well, I've said this before, free agency is really about fixing your draft mistakes. Mm-hmm. If you draft well, you don't need free agency. Exactly. Right, exactly. Because as guys move yeah. on, you've got guys to plug and play. But if you miss on your draft picks, that's where, free, that's where a trade for Jerry Judy comes in because they've missed on how many wide receiver and picks. And not only missed, but if you just don't have the capital. Like in the Browns case, they just they, you're without a first-round pick yeah. for yeah. three years. Any expert is going to tell you that's going to leave a serious mark unless you go out in free agency and you sign quality plug-and-play guys that are ready. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, it is the great eraser in the NFL and building a team is free agency. Gabriel Arias uh, singled in the sixth. He has the two hits that Cutter Crawford has allowed. Jeez. There's two outs in the top of the sixth. He's at first base. Yep. 
And it is still 0-0. Zero, zero. But Both Curry, have Curry's also given up Curry's two pitching hits. very That's well. That's great. And he's into the sixth. Three strikeouts, one walk, two hits, and five innings of work. We're going to move on. But first, we all know I'm a competitive person. Doesn't matter if it's sports. Doesn't matter if it's the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. If there's something to compete at, you know I'm competing. And my next competitive adventure is Monopoly Go. I'm a huge fan, and I'm sure you've heard of it by now because it's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play not one but multiple, multiple boards. I'm talking hundreds in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. And the best part is messing with your friends. You can charge rent on iconic properties like Classic Monopoly, and you can also rob their vaults of riches for yourself. And the leaderboards show you who the biggest Monopoly tycoon truly is, but it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards, so get it on the game and join your friends. Just download the Monopoly Go app. It is free in the App Store or on Google Play. Jay, you weren't here last week when we talked about this. Earl, you were behind the glass, but Jimmy Haslam had said extensions were very close for Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Berry. We talked about why they may not have come yet, but that's not what I want to ask today. Let's just assume for the sake of this it's going to happen at some point. Big picture-wise, and Earl, I want to start with you. Why is continuity at the head coach and general manager position so important for any franchise, but specifically what would it mean for the Cleveland Browns moving forward? I mean, I think continuity is important as long as it's good continuity. You can have toxic and unhealthy continuity for for forever. But I think in in this case here, you have two men that seem to mesh well together, that seem to get along very well. Um, Just the chemistry and philosophy, uh, the fact that they're both very transparent, they can back, they can bounce back and forth off of each other. I think that helps a lot. Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Berry plays a significant role in the Cleveland Browns changing their overall culture. That's just the reality of the situation. And so they've proven to be good human beings. They've proven to be good at, you know, their occupation. And they have the respect of the players, the owners. And it seems like uh, they're gaining respect from other execs across the NFL. The Browns finally have good continuity. I think having continuity and good continuity is two different things. This is a healthy situation. It seems to be uh, growing. It seems like the seeds that's been, been sold is being watered. And you, you're watering a healthy garden here to continue to have a, a, a winning franchise, a healthy culture, a culture, and somewhere that players actually want to come play at going forward. I think that in the NFL, I always look at it as a maze. And the middle is where you want to get. And there's maybe just one path to it. Maybe there's other paths along the way. If you go this way, you still have a chance of getting back to the right road. But when you change your owner, your your leadership group, and I I mean general manager and head coach, you change your point on the horizon. And it's like you're going somewhere and you're three years into that destination and then they rip up the roadmap and you say, nope, you got to go back to go. You got to start all over again and try to get back to where you were. Because more so in the NFL, you're building on every single year what you've done the year before. And there has to be a point on the horizon. We're going to be a defensive uh, focused team with a heavy emphasis of a run. Okay, so that's the Steelers. It, 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 traditionally, historically. Right, right. I know what you mean. They've had three head coaches in my lifetime. They've all won Super Bowls, and the blueprint never changed. It's very difficult because there are cycles to the NFL. There are times when, because the run game was working so much in the 70s, defenses started being built to stop that. Mm -hmm. And then there had teams had to pivot. Okay, we see what you're doing over there on that side of the chessboard. Now we're going to be a team that throws the ball more. And I think we're in the middle of a pivot right now. I think that offense got so far ahead of the defense, and you, that's just go back and look at the scores of the playoff games from three years ago. These teams were scoring in the 40s. Mm-hmm. That everybody in the league said, okay, now we're going to focus on defense. And you started seeing teams draft and build their teams more around their defense. And Patrick Mahomes looked human last year. 
His, he wasn't scoring 45 points a game. His defense was lights out. The Chargers, who a couple of years ago were like a pinball machine, their offense took it because the defense has made a big leap forward. So you have to zig when they zag. And I thought Bill Belichick, for the most part in his career, oftentimes set the trends and at the same time was responding to them on the other side of the ball because he knew what was coming yeah. because they all followed him. And when he made the tight end a position of focus, mm-hmm. what did the rest of the NFL do? Everybody else did it. Everybody else Everybody else. Tight end sets. They Everybody the, else. They had the best pass catch and tight end tandem that I think you were Maybe ever. Maybe ever. Yeah. Because there were two of those guys. Yeah. So with Gronk and Hernandez, the rest of the league was like, wow, what are we going to do? Yeah. How are we going to compete? And thus, Travis Kelsey was born. Yep. And now you're seeing stars there. So when you're changing your leadership every three years, you're perhaps changing your point on the horizon. Because if I asked you, what are the Browns about? What are they? Over the last 20 years, they've been built on what idea? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, even in a pass-happy league, they ended up with the, one of the game's best running backs. So they're not necessarily about running the ball. They're not necessarily about throwing the ball. It's kind of been a hodgepodge because they wash, rinse, and repeat every three years. So I like the fact that Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski are here for a minute, and I really will like the fact if we see these extensions that everybody tells me, don't worry, they're coming. So yeah. I'm not worried. Yeah. But if they don't come, I'm very worried. Because now you're so late in the cycle, what do you do now? Well, I mean, they're, they're, they're coming. I do believe that they're coming. I, and I believe they are. Yeah. But they but better be coming. If you look across sports, the most successful franchises are the ones with stability. That's it. It's the Ravens. It's the Steelers. It's the Heat. It's the Spurs. These are the teams that the GM and the head coach have been married together for X number of years. They know what they want. They know they've done it long enough that they've made the mistakes early on. How many times have I said, you have to give guys long enough to learn from their own mistakes? That never ha- has happened with the Browns. You make a mistake, you're out. Next guy in. They make a mistake, they're out. Next guy in. You have to give them time to learn from their mistakes. And the Browns have made mistakes. Andrew Barry's made mistakes. Kevin Stefanski's made mistakes. But they've had the time to learn from them. And the longer you do it, the better you get at it. And the Heat have a certain way that they go about doing things. And they know what they look for. And, and they identify those players and they win with them. Spurs the same way with Pop and R.C. Buford. They've been there forever. Miami, it's Spolstra and uh, Pat Riley, obviously. They've been there forever. Baltimore, it's John Harbaugh. Been there forever. Steelers, Mike Tomlin. They just had a change in GM for the first time in forever. Like it's always, so you know what you're getting, you know what you're looking for. The Browns have never had that opportunity because they just keep constantly, to your point, they're constantly changing the target of what they're shooting at because everybody who comes in has their new way of doing things, has their own way of doing things. And it's just, you just get stuck in the mud. So I'm excited for it. I'm excited to see some sort of stability, continuity. The Cavs have actually had that for the first time in forever. Even, but LeBron was so good, he erased it all. Like, that was the thing that always, I, when I used to talk to teams when I was covering the NBA, was you have to have stability. Like, you've got to have this culture of stability here, or you're never going to win. But LeBron was so good that he just wiped it all away. Well, what's amazing, though, is had that stability been there, and they had been changing coaches like underwear, he wins more than one. Probably. Because, th- like you said, it's hard to hit a moving target. Yeah. And the target was never standing still. Yeah. Yeah, had they... I don't know. I like we could go down a ton of rabbit holes with that whole thing, but let me let me ask you this. Ultimately, he was here 11 years, he got one championship. What if, and I know this is a big if, but you had a caliber of Phil Jackson, mm-hmm. Pat Riley, even Spolstra, who has become a clone of Pat Riley because he was a sponge to Pat Riley. Yeah. But like I I often wonder had the right head coach been in place Maybe LeBron never leaves, and he's got five. Well, no, because coaching coaching doesn't matter to LeBron. But like, does it great coaching? He's never, you know, what if he had a Phil Jackson? I think he loves to talk about Pop in glowing terms, and Pop talks about him but in glowing terms. But he could never terms. play for Pop. He could. They would strangle each other. I know they would. It, it just would Like, they can sit on opposite sides of the rooms, and they can tell each other how wonderful they are, but if they had to be in the same room together for nine months, it would not go well. I, I would argue that the Cavs actually had two 
phenomenal coaches and fired them both. Fired one guy twice. Mike Brown is a phenomenal coach. Yeah, he's really he's phenomenal. And he got a bad rap. Is Ty Lue the other one? For Ty Lue's the other I one. I think Ty Lue is a great coach. They never like they made and, and I, I really like JB. I really like JB personally. But I it just feels to me like they made so many mistakes at the end of the championship era trying to restart this thing. They made a ton of mistakes. And they've covered a lot of them. They were able, like they've done a really nice job again, learning from your mistakes. Kobe's had time to learn from them. They've done a really nice job of developing guys on the margins and that sort of thing, making the big trade. They've hit on all their draft picks, all of them. Yeah. They've hit on their picks. But the one piece that they never really recovered from, to me, was firing Ty Lue. Mm-hmm. And he is a postseason coach. He's a coach. He's a coach for a veteran team, and I know this was a young team for the last couple of years. He's a coach who's going to give you the rope. during the, Like, they stopped the season – and went and got drunk in Napa for two days. Like in the middle of the season, they said, you know what? That's enough basketball. We're going to Napa and we're going to get drunk for two days on wine. And then we'll come back later and we'll restart this thing later. Figure it out. And, but that's what, that's what he allowed them to do. But then in the playoffs, he pulled them in and he is one of the best postseason coaches in the NBA today. Wow. I would take Ty over almost anyone. The way that he draws up ATOs. The way that he his mind works. And to me, that's that's where the coaches are in his money. That's critical, and that's why the one mistake to me that this organization made, and it was it, like it was ugly between Ty and Kobe that first year post LeBron, it was ugly, and I've had people say he had to go. Like Ty was basically begging to get fired, but had they like Miami didn't fire Spolstra when LeBron left, had they stayed the course with the coach, I think we'd be having different conversations. What's the chances we get them back? Zero. Ty? Yeah. He's in L.A. I mean, I know he's in L.A., but, I mean, the Clippers, as a, as, as a team, they're older. The Clippers the don't seem like they're The man is in L.A. Going. He ain't coming back. I'm just asking the question. <laughs> I'm just asking the question. No, no, Ty, you had your chance there. And he was the hot up-and-coming coach at the time. They paid him a ton of money. And it's funny, like... He just signed a five-year extension last year, too. Yeah, he ain't going anywhere. But it's funny because, like, Dan wanted Blatt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Dan wanted Black. Don't even go there. So that's the worst hire in Cleveland sports history. Oh well, next to Charles Frederick Kitchens, like that's one and one A. Now, I, I still, I still say Kitchens or Beeline. Beeline. <laughs> I told you last week. I got a yeah, call. Beeline was back. I got too. a call two weeks into training camp. He's miserable. He's regretting his decision. I'm like, we're two weeks in. Well, look He's what it's the first in. move that he made. Like there was there he. There was a racial play oh, yeah. right off the yeah, bat. Yeah. And, and I mean, first of all, anyone that thought that was going to work, that, that, that was Dan showing faith loyalty well, and Michigan loyalty. But this loyalty. is where I'm going with it is, like, this is what's hysterical about, like, if you, if you really watch their moves, Dan fell in love with Blatt and wanted Blatt, and Griff was like, oh, my God, okay. Hey, Ty, can you come here and clean up the pieces when this thing implodes? And that's exactly what he did. They fire Blatt and Ty's there. Same well, thing Dan, here. Dan gets enamored with Beeline. Like they're hiring all of these, or they're they're interviewing all of these young assistant coaches. Jamal Mosley, uh, uh, man, I, there was a whole list of guys on their list, and it was all young guys. Mm-hmm. And then they go and hire John Beeline, and Kobe's like, "Oh my God, hey JB, can you come in here and be the safety net for when this thing implodes?" And it imploded far earlier than anyone thought it would. What do you get fifteen but, games? No, the All Star break. He, he, oh, he made it to the All Star break. He made it to the All Star like break. No, earlier. he left at the All Star break and said, "Keep the money. I'm out." Yeah, <laughs> like, which is never. Happened. But like, it's just like it was um, the exact it, same thing. We got to do reads, but uh, Guardians now in the seventh, still scoreless. Uh, the message here is to Major League Baseball: these guys don't want to play it at, at 11, eleven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Uh, Marathon Monday in Boston is a tremendous day, though. I will say no, it is. Time for Super Chats. Day. We're going to do our top five in overtime, by the way. Okay. Uh, Super Chats. First one from Evan419 says, Going into the playoffs with JB as head coach is like boarding the Titanic while knowing the ending. <laughs> uh, Brody's bottom line says, The Cavs, this was in relation to the Cavs avoiding Philly and Miami. It's a loser move. Cavs weren't going to play Miami or Philly until the second round anyway. Halim Youssef says, Jason hit it on the head. This all started going downhill when they lost a spider tack. The pitch clock exacerbated everything and took it to the next level. Just give him the tacky bag back. And Mud says, if A.B. and Kevin don't get the extensions and get fired, not going to happen, but what if, would Deep Podesta get fired too? Once again, I want to reiterate, they're not getting fired. I'm just asking the question. 
Yeah, they're not getting fired. They're not, but to answer his question, because he paid for the Super Chat, shout out to you for that. Paul D. Podesta, I don't think is going nowhere. No. Well, Paul is clearly, <laughs> he is the king of the castle. And if, if you don't think he is, tell me why he's survived multiple regimes. Yep. They, rightly or wrongly, he has Jimmy Haslam's ear, and he's not going anywhere unless Jimmy has a change of heart. But in the past, it was weird because they had this guy here, but they never listened to him. They went and hired people that wanted nothing to do with him that threw his people out of meetings. Like, it was just, the whole thing was weird. I agree with you now. Like, he's... He's it. Yeah. But it, for in the past, he was here, and they didn't ever listen to him. I don't know. We'll see you in overtime. Peace. Ohio State just got a five-star transfer from Kentucky. We'll talk about it. Peace.